Okay, I got the red smoke. Gun run! North and south! West of the smoke! West of the smoke! Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Come on, win it, man. They give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. Well, Percentile-wise, we have the largest brains. The largest brains or the largest heads? The combination. Because <laughs> I think you could have a large head and not a large brain. That's true. I've seen big-headed dudes <laughs> with low attitude. Yeah, you're like, you're doing some dumb shit, dude. You got a big head, though, so let's get you a double XL helmet, and we're going to put you in the back, and here's a ladder you're going to so carry. So true. So true. You got to be Asian, though. The Asian thing uh, brings it all together. I think the ratio gets squared away with that. I don't feel like I can actually... Uh make any comments about that. <laughs> I think that you are the only one who can make any comments about that, and I'll leave that to you. <laughs> Asians are super racist. We're just, that's how we are. <laughs> it's also a very broad statement. I think maybe some Asians. Are you racist? Are Asians racist against oh, other Asians or against... Horribly. Horribly. Where is that from? Uh, Imperial China and Japan, <laughs> and it goes all the way down to every Asian race. My, my mom, she... Like, I had a buddy, and um, his, name's, his, his nickname is Fink, but he was half Japanese and half German. And I went through him with all training that we went to in special operations. We went together, and she knew he was half Japanese, and she said, you cannot let him beat you at anything. And I was like, well, why would you bring that? Like, what does that even mean? Like, why are you saying it so intently? She goes, you, you cannot be beaten by a Japanese person. I was like, Mom. You're joking. Tell me you're... And she wasn't joking. That is some deeply ingrained <laughs> shit there. It is. Holy fuck. It's super, uh, it's super ingrained. It's the the Koreans against the Japanese and the, the kind of the Japanese and Koreans against China. It's known. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't know we were going to open with this. <laughs> oh, is this an opening? <laughs> oh, we're recording. Yes, sweet. Oh, awesome. <laughs> That's... We can... No, I'm not going to... Don't. I'm not even going to say that. I'm going to edit it out. <laughs> I have learned that the best thing to do is... When you get the headset on, immediately hit the button and make sure that it's red. That's it. You got to. And it gets even better when the person you're talking to doesn't know that it's red. <laughs> because there are people that I have sat down with who are very different in their personality. They're yeah. the microphone off, like having a blast. Uh, and they switch on. Yes. I, I'm not that. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the same way. I make yeah. a fool of myself and conduct myself as a moron with the microphone on or off. I'm the same way. I can't. There, there's no switch for me. I'm not a politician. <laughs> I'll never be. Do you... People ever hit you up about going into politics? Yeah, I've been asked before. Um, I think I'm I'm like the guy who loves the sheriff because he's that one elected official who has power, but he has influence, but he's at the tactical level. Yeah. Um, but I've never had an aspiration politically to to be on top. That's what I was going to ask: is whether or not you have a desire to do that. I people will reach out to me occasionally, like, "Oh, you need to go into politics," and my response generally is. I can't think of something I would rather do less yeah, yeah. than be a politician. Yeah. I just, maybe you'd have the ability to have some impact, but I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I, when I see like Dan Crenshaw or some of the guys from the teams. I, I put him through buds. That's, no, really? Yeah, he had two eyes then. Really? That's <laughs> awesome, man. I was, he, he seems was, like a good dude. He's awesome. Yeah. And uh, I actually had him on the podcast and he was, um, God, he was telling me about you know his eye injury. I was like, yeah, but I had PRK. My eyes hurt a little bit. <laughs> and he literally just looked at me deadpan and was like, really? <laughs> like I said, I conduct myself as an idiot at all times because he's talking about being blind for months. And I was like, yeah, man, I had some dry eye when I got this PRK done. <laughs> My new contacts are killing me right now. <laughs> he's a unique one. I wouldn't uh, – so let's see. He was the class OIC. So I went from the East Coast and – Dropped into Buds for about 18 months and was an instructor there. You do uh, – did you ever go back to the schoolhouse as a teacher? No, I dodged it. Yeah. Uh, most uh, people, hardcore. I tried me, to yeah. dodge it too. I ended up being, uh, I think, my most rewarding tour. I hear that a lot. You get to yeah. – it's really – you can actually see and physically feel how much you can mold the community. Because mm. the, the students are super malleable, for one. They yeah. want to be there. Post-9-11 world. It's not like they're like, hey, I saw this movie. I think – they yeah. might be doing some cool stuff. They like, know what they're getting into. They're getting, they know what they're getting yeah. more than I did in 96. I watched Charlie Sheen jump off a bridge. And I was like, I'm That's, it. I know. That, that was so, <laughs> so epic, man. That made everybody want to be a SEAL. Yeah, but nobody ever does that in the community. D really? Not once? Uh, there was a SEAL who got in trouble for base jumping off the Coronado Bridge. He was caught later on because his uh, you know extract plan was just, it was subpar. I feel like you're talking about yourself when you say No, I'm not. 
I, because my extract plan would have been awesome, it would have involved shit kinning that rig in a boat with a dragger, and I would have gone out. Smart. Of di- you know what I mean? Like, have you done that one yet? The Coronado Bridge or yeah. the dragger? The Coronado Bridge. No, I have not jumped the Coronado Bridge. Mm. I would, Are you still jumping? I'm jumping substantially less, but uh, I was just talking to a guy who lives down in Missoula. Apparently, there's some really good wingsuit jumps pretty proximal to where we are within an hour to Whoa. two drive. Yeah. I mean, you, I mean, obviously the topography and geography here is, is pretty amazing. There's the glacier national park. You probably, if you were staying in summers, I've, I've driven to, through there before. Okay. It's insane. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Now, obviously in a national park, it's not exactly what they call legal, you know? So mm. you got to deal with those issues. Yeah. Yeah. You got to infill. And I know, and I'm not a fan of jumping in places where it's illegal because there's enough stuff on your mind as it is. I don't have to, I don't want to have to be looking around for law enforcement. Yeah. In addition to standing on the edge, like, okay, I really need to nail this exit. Yeah. So, so there's places where it's designated legal. Um, you can jump BLM land. That's really? how uh, you know Trevor. We were talking about yeah. uh, Trevor. No, he's not going to kick me in the dick. He told me. Yeah. Social distancing. I, our dicks could only be so close together. I know, and it's weird. Why does it have to be about the dicks all the time? I know. He. That's the first thing he goes to. I know. Trevor, man, you know. He's probably drawn to him. I would say in a variety of ways. <laughs> <laughs> he just likes the dick. I don't. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Um, Good dude. Though. I love Trevor. But he. Yeah. He's awesome. He jumps down in Moab. And they can jump, I think, within sight of... I've never jumped there, but I believe they're jumping in sight of the actual town of Moab because it's, it's BLM land. And I don't think it necessarily says it's allowed. I think it just doesn't expressly say it's not allowed. Yeah. It's kind of a gray So area. nobody's enforcing Nobody's stuff. enforcing. Uh, I actually just don't think it's illegal. Um, national parks, though, they have, you know, uh, Yosemite, you know, Half Dome yeah. is... Um, unbelievable like you want to talk about it a crazy cliff face to jump and it's been jumped probably thousands yeah. of times but um, I believe it's in the regulations it's like an anti-parachute drop something in there specifically it specifically designates parachute activities inside of national parks oh okay so national parks are no no BLM land to my understanding are uh, it's fine and then I assume private property or you know most guys are just look I mean most guys just look at stuff and they're like yeah I can get away with it and they just do it. And they kind of do it. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I don't, you guys, that's just another thing. Like, I don't even know. Cause I, I you know, I'm, I was a Halo jump master and I, I got into it for a period of time. I'm like, I can go down this rabbit hole yeah. and get into it. But wingsuit flying is just, it's not even in the same genre. It's just something different. That was years down the road for me, though. I went, uh, I don't know how it was in the SF community, but in the SEAL community, when I got in, Getting good schools was completely based off seniority. Mm. And free fall is now part of this SEAL pipeline. So you go... Your own, you guys got your own school. We have our own school. So yeah. it goes BUDS, six months. Then you have STT, uh, SEAL Tactical Training. Or no, it's SQT, SEAL Qualification Training. And at the end of that, you get your, you get your Trident, which the teams used to give individually. Mm-hmm. And they would, uh, the teams used to do geographic-specific training pre-9-11. Mm-hmm. Like there was a desert team and a jungle team, and so you'd be assigned and get your extra additional training. You would, and the, and the, each team kind of had their own curriculum, and you can obviously see the problem with that, mm-hmm. right? Like you know, seven, eight different teams, seven, eight different products, mm-hmm. specialties in one area, and then they're like, "Hey, all you go to the same place and play well together." Mm-hmm. That doesn't see work. That. I could see that. So now it's buds, SQT, but I believe before SQT is straight to static line, and then a literal walk across probably a hallway into free fall. Mm. But when I got in, that was not the case. And uh, we went to Static Line. Benning, get some. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Did you attend that lovely course? I, I did. That was, unfortunately, <laughs> that was, I did it after Ranger School, too. So I was broken and hungry, and yeah. I was just happy to eat. But I hated that course. Sergeant Airborne did not like us because they took my entire Buds class and put us in one class. Ooh. Which was a, an incredibly poor decision. Oh. Because we went from an environment where we were just getting our dicks kicked in every yeah. single day to an environment where even when they tried the best to kick our dicks in, yeah. we're like, this is awesome. Yeah, it's so weak. <laughs> it's so weak. Stand on your cables or whatever the hell they used to say. I'm yeah, like, Fuck. airborne shuffle and running to yeah. everywhere. So I did that, did five jumps there, checked into Team 5, and God, my first platoon, we had a guy who just loved doing air ops. Mm-hmm. So we did a couple, a few two-week chunks of air. And the reason he loved it is because he was on the right-hand side of the C-130. The dude's going to altitude. Mm. So the rest of us were on the left-hand side of the C-130, mm. also going to altitude, but triple-digit altitude, not, you know, 12,000, 13,000 feet. So I have like 80 static line jumps. Oh. 
And you know the deal. Like, you just hear people screaming for help in the ground. Just oh, like, man. oh, God. Oh, God. There's nothing about that. It's just, you, it's like, that's funny. There's even a course for it. It's, you can't even, like, why even train something? Just tell people to jump out of the bird, tuck their uh, feet and knees together, and just, you're going to eat it. And relax. Yeah, the just relax. The best advice they could give you is just right before you hit, tell yourself that you're a drunk driver. Yes. And just, yeah. I didn't get that advice. And, bruised my ankles on my first jump. I would heels head on my Ugh. first jump directly backwards, and I laid there for a long time watching other canopies open, thinking, I don't know if I can do the next four of these. Oh, God. But I I saw how much, I mean, like, these guys were getting down, like, woo-woo, did you see me out doing backflips? And I'm just sitting there, like, you know, nursing my calf or yeah. trying to put my shoulder back in the socket. <laughs> I was like, fuck this. I went out to a civilian drop zone and actually learned on my own over the course of a weekend because there's only seven jumps. And I did the class on a Friday. I was jumping on my own by Sunday and then just started jumping because I loved it. And I actually challenged the military course out in Yuma. Oh, I, really? Yeah, a message That's came out. That's rare. That's rare. And I don't think they've done it that many times, but it was like, hey, if you got, I think it was 250 jumps or something like that. It might have even been lower. But you come out and you basically just did the jumps, the graded jumps. Mm -hmm. And they had to teach you how to pack the gear, obviously. So I did that, and then when I got out to the command on the East Coast, I went from no air qualifications. I went static line jump master directly to a JSOC free fall jump master, directly to AFF, directly to tandem. Oof. In a course of like four months. Uh, you did JSOC's tandem course? Yeah. Oh, that was that's brutal. That's scary. I've never been that, but <clears throat> that's that's scary. There were a few moments in that course where I reconsidered the decisions that I had made in life. Yeah. The first one was when you, you know, of course in the military, the best way to teach you to jump out of an airplane with another human, having two people strapped together who have never done it is just to strap together and hope for the best. Yeah. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> so we did it. And, uh, I had more jumps than my partner, which we were ratioed up by height weight and, uh, had some horrendous experiences on the front of that individual, just <sighs> drastic instability and, much like the Top Gun scene where, you know, Goose has to eject because he's corkscrewing out into space. Oh, that's horrible. And then you start... You were the piss passenger. Yeah, we would alternate back and forth. Oh, man. So it would be like, okay, whew, I'm in charge on this one to just sit in there, and, you know, and your thumbs are just in the harness. And you're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> Damn. Is there any EPs for you guys that are being harnessed? Um, they do not teach you EPs from the person in front in that harness. But what I can tell you is you can reach and manipulate each of the handles. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Are you pulling... So you're gonna, you're going to go back and reach... You his, have to control yourself. Handle. You, yep. You have uh, the main... Uh, Pillow. Yeah. Uh, yep. Well, actually, so you throw a drogue. You throw a drogue. Because right. you need yeah. that. And you can reach that from the front. Yep. And I know that because I had to deploy it on one of the jumps. Oof. And, you know, you're, you have a handle that's basically right by where your pocket would be on your right leg. And then there's another one on the back on the... Uh, Oh, let me see here. Where is it? It's system check. You throw it, check your drogue, primary. So primary is actually on your left-hand side, yeah. And then you have the right-hand pocket. Um, and then you have cutaway and reserve in the same places. Yeah. And as a tandem master, you go out. You know, you set your drogue, you check your drogue, primary, secondary, cutaway, reserve. And, uh, yeah, you can reach all those from the front. That's crazy, man. It's not briefed, but I'm just saying, all I'm saying to you right you gotta now is- You got to do what you got to do. You can reach those from the front. Ooh. And then you strap yourself to a bundle, so it starts passenger, and then they give you a bundle about the size of this table. Actually, you know what? It's damn near the size of this table. And exactly. If you were to round it, and you know they're like, okay, let's put sandbags in this, and, the, and you make your own, and you harness it up, and it looks big, and you're like, this is maybe this, you know, this is the, like the best idea. <laughs> it rips you out of the bird. Yeah, this like isn't the best idea I've ever done. And then you you know you go and you ride up to the air, you ride up to altitude, you hook up at the six minute mark. And then the ramp comes down, and you just have these two little nylon handles. And I remember my first jump, you have a cameraman. He's, he's, you know, he's giving you this, and you're like, come on, come on. And then he stops you when the bundle's about halfway off the airplane. And I remember just standing there waiting for him to give me the go. And all I could think of was this is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> It literally, it was the thought I had. I'm like, what in the fuck am I doing here? I have to poop right now thinking about this <sighs> moment. And, and all you do, because you're connected by a tether. <sighs> So you push it as hard as you can, and the classic exit is the shopping cart where guys just kind of like shove it out of the plane because they're scared, <laughs> and then you see them, they're like, Bleh! they get it pulled out. What you're supposed to do is push it out, and you hold on. So you're going out the back of the airplane. You basically hold on until the bundle gets vertical. You let go. It drops and settles, 
and then you're in free fall. Yeah. And you go through your same thing. You check yeah. your joke. It pulls second. you into free fall. So there's, oh, yeah. no, there's no hill. It just yanks well, you. Well, you kind of go on the hill. What ends up happening is it'll get vertical, and as you let it go, it kind of like, brink. And the drogue saves you. You know, but you what you also have is a drogue setter mm-hmm. on the aircraft. But once in the course, you have to do a self set. So you have to go out and you have to you know push the bundle and get it. And what you want to do is drop it, and it will continue to rock you forward. But as you're coming forward, you'll get that drogue out and it'll pull you back. Mm-hmm. There are some faces of death videos oh. of dudes who like shopping cart it, and then so they get tugged and they start this orbit where the bundle's just like na 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 na. <laughs> so they can't get the drogue out. They can't. You can. You still, you basically. You're just, just fighting it. You arch because the bundle yeah. falls faster than you. There's almost no drag because it will orient itself. Yeah. You know, the cylindrical, the bottom side down. And uh, you see these guys are just like underneath the bundle arching as it's above them. And it'll pass them and just boink. And then they get their drogue out. Can you cut it away? You can. Um, but you don't want to. I yeah. mean, you, what you need to do is essentially just fly through it. But there are videos of people who get underneath the bundle and they'll set the drogue and their drogue will entangle with the tether of their bundle. Oh. And now you're in for a rodeo ride. Oh, man. Because if it entangles enough, you're not going to be able to cut that bundle away anymore. Ooh. Oh, it can get spicy. Oh, I, I've, heard of, I've heard of dudes burning in that course. Yeah. and I, mean, I had 200 jumps when I went to that course. Oh, my gosh. Actually, you know what? I think I had more than that. I had probably maybe somewhere between two to 500. The average person there, I would say their logbook said around 200, but they probably had 50 to 75. Wow. The rest of them were just pencil whipped yeah, in the team. That was, that's, yeah, that's my job. <laughs> yeah. But that's time. what you're saying about, you know, do you want to go down that rabbit hole? I definitely, I loved it, but I didn't touch a wingsuit until I had been out of the military for <sighs> three years. I don't think I put a wingsuit on until I had maybe 3,500 jumps. Dang. I always feel like when it's something when when guys do wingsuit stuff and and I look at Trevor, I'm like, hey, he's a normal dude. Mm-hmm. But then you realize there's this all segment of things that he does in his <laughs> extracurricular time, and I'm like, what's the? And I and I get it because there's a portion of you know our brains and our you know bodies that have been pushing limits in certain areas and arenas, and it's just an out. It, it could even just be an out, you know, just an outlet. To, it doesn't have to be adre- about adrenaline for a lot of people. Is, I think for was it about adrenaline for you? Um, no. Just like I don't think our job was about adrenaline, I yeah. liked the absolute presence of mind and the focus, mm, I like which to see. Yeah. which is probably a byproduct of the adrenaline. Yeah, but it's a process. It, yeah, people always think that something like that, like we're adrenaline junkies, and I'm like, man, I don't really remember even in active gunfights having a lot of adrenaline. I mean, it's just I don't think it would be a positive impact. I think it would be harder. I think, well, we also had more of an exposure to it, and I think in a systematic and structured approach to dealing with it. Mm -hmm. But I think for most people, if they got just this bolus dump of adrenaline, I mean, you know, their fine motor skills are going to probably disappear. They're going to start shaking their thought process, their tunnel vision. And I don't remember having any of those things occur either. Mm -hmm. But I do remember being able to make some of the clearest decisions of my life. Like, this is obviously the call we need to make right now. Wow. Okay, so the focus. like The focus. And yeah. then, and then you know, when you're standing on the edge in a nylon straitjacket, mm-hmm. you're pretty focused. You're able to arrive at that position again. And yeah. I don't know the mechanism that drives the mind there, but, you know, they've written books about it. They just call it the flow state. And uh, that, I think, is what a lot of people are, are looking for. Did you ever have an experience in the military – outside of something as dangerous and as technical as wingsuit flying. Did you ever have anything in the military where you felt you were on the flow state? Was it CQB? Was it Oh, I would, I would hit that place all the time. I think, uh, for me, the place I noticed it the most was probably right at about the one minute out on the mm-hmm. helos. Okay. As you approach short yeah. final, or you go past you know, your set point and you're rapidly approaching where you're going to breach, just that like everything kind of locks into yep, place. Yep. That's where I would find that the most. Yeah. And I think the reason I enjoy base jumping so much is I really like that mental and emotional state because it's clear. You know what I mean? It's clear. The ability to make decisions. You're not worried about other stuff. So all of your mental acuity is focused in on just one thing that you need to do. And fuck, man, the ability to perform in that moment is just unbelievable. It's like I'm assuming it's almost like mental hygiene where you get out of that experience and it does something for you 
you know, whether it's like a clairvoyant experience or just something to your mental health that you get off, it's like a reset button, yep. and then you just go through the process again until you accumulate. I think there's, I think there's huge value. I mean, if you think about, let's use modern times right now, right? The middle of the COVID pandemic. I think people right now are absolutely living in a state of fear for most people. Yeah. They don't know what to do. They're watching the pandemic numbers rise, which spoiler alert, everybody, the number's not going to go down. Yeah. It will continue to go up and that doesn't, it shouldn't really impact your decision-making process because you can't control that. Mm -hmm. But there, I was thinking about it uh, last time I was uh, in the car just driving. I was like, I wonder what percentage of information that people consume on a daily basis is positive versus negative. (sighs) I bet you it's at least 70% negative. Yeah. And I think that's low, actually. I think it might be 80 to 90. Yeah, I agree. It's got to be the fringe. The fringe has to be negative yeah. or it won't emotionally. But that informs how you behave, yeah. right? And if all of your time and energy and effort is spent thinking about those things, no wonder people are stressed out. So if you can find a way to strip all of that bullshit away in one of those flow states, I think there's huge benefit to the... And I have no understanding of the mechanism, but I personally feel... And would always feel like I would go on a two-week base jumping trip to Switzerland. Um, I would feel different for two, three, four months afterwards just because of not thinking about all the normal bullshit that I would and being able to find that moment again. I find that there's huge value there. I don't think think people should do that. I don't think anybody should do anything that I do. Certainly don't stand on the edge of a cliff in a a nylon suit, but it worked for me. Yeah. You know? Oh, it could be, I mean, shit, it could be gardening for a woman, you know, a, an older lady who's in her flow. Yeah. That's her, that's the her mental process, the concentration, the focus. Uh, I mean, that's why the, I mean, bringing up the Japanese, getting back to being racist. Um, <laughs> the, the, those stone gardens, man, those guys. With the rakes? The rakes and stuff, all those little simple processes. That's why I think, I mean, this is outside of that spectrum, but manufacturing processes, that's why the U S isn't very good at it. Cause we live in that vicious cycle of mental instability versus those countries where they want to be tuned in technically to their hands and to their eyes and this focus. And that for them is happiness. So you, some people go, Oh, that's, they're working for pennies on the dollar and I'm trying to justify child labor or, or, <laughs> bad, or bad labor rates, <laughs> but there's something culturally about that. It's, it's, it's ingrained in the culture, especially Asian culture. Well, I think you can find, that flow state through meditation. And I don't know anything about rock gardens, but I would assume that type of activity, that repetitive nature where you're focused on the connection between mind and body. Mm -hmm. I would have to imagine that that's just another way to find that. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. I think that coming, you know, post-military, it's crazy to me that, I mean, maybe it's changed and I've heard this a little bit, but it's crazy to me that nobody teaches us mental health processes and hygiene to, to rebuild or, you know, dispose of all the wasting that we're developing over our minds and over our bodies that obviously has physiological effects. So they don't teach us how to find a, a, a right headspace to meditate. And we find, find our own outlets, our outlets yeah. you know, crotch rockets and free fall skydiving and everything else that might even... I mean, damn, teach us how to do meditation. Competitive drinking. Competitive drinking. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All the bad things yeah. are our outlets when we should probably be thinking about meditation. I hope that has changed, actually. Mm-hmm. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember ever really having that topic broached other than maybe a scratch of the service. Yeah. There was never a deep dive. There was never a lot of money allocated or time allocated or importance allocated to that perspective, the mental health and hygiene. Were you in that buds? Were you in the buds classes that had the hood and you pull the hood and you have to react or respond to something like somebody's there when they pull the hood and they go to punch you in the face and you, so you're talking about the hooded box drill. Yeah. I experienced that. But when I was going through selection on the East coast and I'm not going to say that motherfucker's name because I, it dry, the fact that he was able to fool the military yeah. into doing that and his little fire hands and his little were knead you, in where you punched in the face yeah. where all that stuff. Yeah. And we had to do the hooded box drill and then he's like, you can't do it again because you're forged. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, Oh, why can't I do it again? Why is there no value to having, The reps. The reps (laughs) and being in an environment where you can't see anything and then all of a sudden you have to make a snap decision based on, like, what are you fucking talking about? Man, I'm I'm, I'm surprised (laughs) there's no... I don't know of anybody who did it in Buds, though, but he had a contract 
for a long time. Yeah. And there were people who dove deep into that. And I don't, I don't understand the, I don't understand how it's possible for people to believe so deeply into something that is obviously bullshit. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm aware that it happens. Yeah. I just don't know how it does. Yeah. I've seen, I mean, there's different, man, the Navy and the, the army. I, I think we're, our services are closer than most services for some reason. I don't, I don't know why that is. But well, I, I think our communities are defined by their similarities, not their differences. Yes. The job itself is probably 99.5% the same. We probably had more of a water emphasis often than you guys, yeah. you know, had Rucks more. Yeah. And, and, but then it, it, we're all in the same sandbox. Yeah. Doing relatively the same thing. Yeah. I've worked with um, multiple SEAL teams. Um, I was in Afghanistan when SEAL Team 10 was there during Red Wings and stuff. And then... Um, Subsequently, had a whole bunch of joint ops with. You know, at the time, I was in the commanders and extremist force, and they were mating us up for doing emergency response unit stuff, ICTF, the Iraqi Counterterrorism Force. And those guys, I remember. I mean, they were young guys. So was I. I mean, I was in yeah. my mid twenties, um, early two thousands. But they seemed to have. I don't know what it is, and I, I actually use it when I brief and talk about preparedness. That. Your community, for some reason, I and mean, maybe it's just indoctrinated, has a better mindset in resilience and in mental fortitude. And it's something that's like ingrained. It's like, oh, I'm a Navy SEAL. I, this is, is kind of on topic, but this, this denotes the behavior. This one kid, he was like 22 years old. And I, at the time, I was a sniper, and I was on a whole bunch of um, – I was in a team with a whole bunch of senior guys, like the most senior guys. In fact, uh, one, one E8 or Master Sergeant list, I think my whole team made E8 moving on. And one of my guys said, hey, you know, we'd like to link up later and do some stuff, maybe go through some CQB and do some different training together. And he goes, he looks him straight in the face, and this kid's like 22 years old. He goes, what could you possibly teach me? <laughs> and I was like, I laughed. I was like, oh shit, this is real. But he was a young kid. And I remember that mental toughness in, in the kids. It's almost similar to Ranger Regiment that a lot of guys in my community didn't have initially. And what I was like, is is? This, I, I think it's part of its hell week, right? Part of its hell week, like a common bond and then a common experience and trauma. I mean, that's very significant in survival and preparedness. Well, the buds is unique in the fact that you know if you have a trident, you all came through the same filter. Yeah, officer and enlisted side by side, which is unique. Yeah, um, as far as my understanding, in most selection processes worldwide, mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen it firsthand where you know the officers will bounce in and out of the training, and there is a rift that is created there just between the enlisted and officer level. But there's oh in buds they do that. No, no, in buds they go side, side by side. Side by side, yeah. Yeah, it's but that in my understanding is atypical in most selection process globally in the military because the officers will need refinement training, right? But if you pull people out of physically arduous stuff because they need other additional training, yeah. When they come back, it's like, hey, motherfucker, mm -hmm. you didn't. You no, know, no. I like this means something to me, but yours is like yours is blue. Yeah. It's inert. The you animosity know? is built there. And, yeah, yeah, and the cool thing about buds is that you know if you were a seal, if you've ever worn a trident, you went through Hell Week. You all went through that same crucible. So there's a, I find there's a similarity between a lot of the guys and their personalities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I, and maybe that is it. I don't know. I no, mean, I've it, I've seen some mentally fucking tough ODA dudes. I mean, I've worked with every branch of. The U.S. military special forces component and had great experience as well. All of them. Yeah, I think one of the things is like Ranger School. Like I went to Ranger School very young. I was 18 years old, and I remember having this common bond. Even as a young, I think I was an E3. I was a private first class when I went to Ranger School. But even as a young PFC who had the only person in his his uh, infantry company that was Ranger qualified was my first sergeant, and so my first sergeant bonded with me immediately because we had this shared Connection. common yep. experience. But when you look at special forces training, specifically the Green Berets, it's like log PT is one of the, you know, it's one of the gates, but it's a two hour session or the star land navigation course, but that's one week long and it's not a suck fest. You eat, you sleep, you just ruck and then do land navigation. Yeah. I wish we had that 
common bonding experience that one week or that two week, whatever it is, that everybody, you know, across the board equally could have a shared experience in. For SF training, it's is it, it correct me if I'm wrong, but it's done in phases and there's also a time in between, right? Yeah, totally. Well, the first thing you do is SFAS selection. It's Special Forces Assessment and Selection. Yep. That's, and, and the, one of the problems here inherently is it's changed because officers come in there and they're like, I want to reinvent the wheel, get this on my OER, let's, let's change and manipulate it. So it's changed from three weeks to four weeks to five weeks down to 18 days. That's supposed to be the standard. And then you go into the pipeline, which is, you know, like you guys' pipeline, but it's called the qualification course. Now they go to language school and SEER school up Pre-Q front. Pre-Q course? Pre-Q, pre-starting, because what they were finding, and I was, this, I was this type of class, you go through 18 months, sometimes two plus years of training. If you're a medic, you're doing it for two years at least. Oh, for sure. As an 18 Bravo, a Special Forces weapons guy, I was uh, 18 months, had gaps in between phases, but the last uh, bit of training was SEER school. It was seer high risk. Um, that that is pretty common among special operations guys. Went there and we had guys quit. And so the question was, so what happens when you quit? And like you go home. They quit in seer school. They quit in seer school. Was this up in Washington? This one was in. So we have our own one at Special Warfare Center. Okay. That's liaised on by Air Force components, but it's seer high risk C, and it's a uh, Army Special Operations aviators and SF guys. Okay, because we went to, at the end of selection for the East Coast, we went to high-risk SEER as well. Yeah. And I can't really imagine somebody quitting in that. I don't, it's weird. It's, I don't know if, it's weird, man. I've, I've seen some, I've seen the most highly trained individuals be in those kind of circumstances and just whimper and cry in the fetal. Which is which I don't understand either. I mean, and you, that's you know. such an investment in time and money Years. to get that person. Yeah, eighteen months. I think by the time Years. they put a bird on somebody, it's it's over a million dollars per guy. It's got to be. Yeah, and the same has to be true of your community as well. I mean, eighteen yeah. months of training, all those additional so schools, much training. Yeah. Well, that's what we're not good at, man. We're not good at we're not good at sustainment or retention. We're not good at holding on to the investment that we put into people. Yeah. We're just we're all about hey, let's just surge it and get more new people to filter through the process instead of just holding on to what we got. That was the cool part, man. I mean, we opened, I was talking to you about, you know, going back as a buds instructor and even with Crenshaw, I mean, it was cool. I remember sitting down and he would have to check in with me directly every day because I was his proctor and got to know him. And he's actually one of the few people I remember because you saw some, and, and I don't say that negatively about the other students, I saw a shit ton of them and they saw six of us. Mm-hmm. So it's easier for them yeah. to remember me not because I'm special, but I j- they saw less of us. But I could see the direct impact of the training pipeline. And it, a lot of the things that we did when I went through as a student, where I was like, this is stupid. I was like, oh, mm. this is why we do this. It was this. very deliberate. It was very deliberate. Yeah. And then, I mean, truly, you had your hand a little bit on the wheel of what the future of the community was going to look like. You know, the curriculum did, I'd say the curriculum did 90% of the job. And then the other 10% is why those instructors are there, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. to sit there and look at somebody and to work with the other instructors and be like, hey, this person is not going to fit in our community. Mm. We need to, we need to have the ability. We absolutely must have the ability to make decisions for the best interest of the community that are outside of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Because other, I mean, well, no selection process is perfect. And don't get me wrong. I served with some serious fuckwits. We all went through the same yeah. training, oh, yeah. you know, and yeah. oh my God. They're everywhere. That guy is everywhere. Oh yeah. Criminals, um, rapists, murderers, on yeah. a man in my bud's classes in jail for murder. It's no big deal. Wow. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> but it's, you know, uh, um, I was talking with Joe about it recently. I'm like, he's not, he wasn't actually being selected for honor. He had yeah. the highest statistical pass rate on all the evolutions. Yeah. And that was the only thing they could proficient. Could, yeah. He was technically proficient at buds, by the way. So he was great at flutter kicks in, you know, the obstacle course and swimming. So <laughs> was he a serial killer or just a regular killer? Um, he probably would have been a serial killer. He and his wife uh, would lured a couple back to their apartment uh, and cited an argument, killed him, chopped him up and put him in grocery store dumpsters. Wow. And got caught stealing shirts out of a Hooters. That's how he got caught? Yeah. I believe her, I, the woman's ID in a spider co with a bunch of like flesh and hair in it was in her purse. <laughs> what? Yeah, high level criminal. That was the way they got caught. Yes, never... they got caught attempting to steal T-shirts from a Hooters. 
Oh, my gosh. Wow. <laughs> you don't hear about that often. That's crazy. I've only heard about it once. <laughs> <laughs> we have ours, though. I mean, let's. Yeah. Oh, let's, let's be clear. We all. Yeah. The thing is, too, you know, to want to pursue that job and that community, the argument could be made that we potentially each have a few screws loose. Yeah. And some of us probably have more loose than I'm on, others. I'm on that train. Yeah. It, well, it, the behaviors that I find, or the behaviors, the activities that I really enjoy are atypical to most people. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were not atypical in the community of people that I serve with. People mm-hmm. are like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, well, skydiving, yeah. fuck yeah, let's do not it. Not even thinking about it. Not yeah. even thinking about it. And I also understand, though, why why people are like, hey, uh, that doesn't that doesn't seem to make sense. So I'm not going to try to say I don't have a few screws loose. But yeah. the problem with the training that we got is if you have more screws loose than most and you're smart enough not to get caught at Hooters, yeah, you can cause a serious fucking problem. <laughs> People people <laughs> underestimate that man. I, I yeah. and I, what I'm I'm kind of fascinated by because I'm always tracking like statistics on this stuff and trying to look into it more often. That there's not overt killers that have come out of our community, and and I think maybe because it, they're not getting caught. I was just gonna say it might be because they're covert. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, let's be. I oh my god, I sat around in team spaces for years oh, yeah. and just talked about how we would rob banks. Course of action development. Oh my God. I'm like, listen, yes. you know what? We definitely need some sixties or two forties up in this elevated position. Yes. Like this is how we would literally think about for hours, how we were going to commit crimes. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that happened in your community. Yeah. I actually, <laughs> when I was a team sergeant, I actually told my guys I've done training, uh, exercises off the books, um, that were, them doing passive, over, and sometimes covert reconnaissance using different means, you know, on foot, CTR, you know, standoff, OPs, the list goes on. But I would have them do a recce of a bank and collect as much information as possible, bring it back to the team room, products, get them posted, and then go through a, you know, an MDMP, the, like a military decision-making process, and have them plan a robbery based on the information that they collected in a certain window. And it's like, you're not, you know, some people call it robberies. We just call it a raid. You know, it's like conduct and plan a, or plan and conduct a raid. And that thinking outside the box and then looking at uh, CONUS infrastructure, like in the U S was super advantageous for them to operate in austere environments and just adapt on the fly. And then think that way. Yeah. I want them to always be going into stores and, living their normal lives and be considering what if they had to take this place down? Because that was their job. DA, hostage rescue, SR, the list goes on as their job. So, When was uh, the last time that you went into a building and didn't at least give it a peripheral look? Never. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Even when I came in this building. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, when we bought this house, I was like, oh, this is excellent. I have uh, some good fields of fire. We're slightly elevated position here. I could definitely flank to the west. <laughs> I almost stopped at the end of the road and just kind of like yeah. looked around because I, I was losing – Spatial awareness because it's so high. Yeah, it's elevated. It's overlooking some epic terrain. And it's funny too is uh, <laughs> I look at that the way that I'll and I'm not I'm not like sitting there crazy like it, like it, I'll hear people like you know or ask me do you always sit with your back to the wall I'm like no I'm not paranoid <laughs> like I don't I'm not and I well I'm not talking shit against the people who want to do that but I, yeah. I I I choose to live my life in a way where I'm not gonna constantly think. That there is going to be a threat around every corner. If I'm yeah. out having pizza with my kids, mm-hmm. like I'm going to sit in a place where, don't get me wrong, I'm, a, I'm aware of what's going on in the environment, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to have my kids like, you will put your back on the corner. Did it? Like, let's just have a nice yeah. meal. Like, it's, it, you know, the odds are in our favor. Having said that, I mean, I live in Montana, so I'm gunned up 24 7, which is mm-hmm. glorious. You actually get a ticket here if you don't have a gun. Really? I don't know if that's true, but it's what I tell people. <laughs> <laughs> I got several. I think I'm, I'm yeah, good right now. Yeah, you're going to be fine. Uh, yeah. Arizona. But do you do it automatically? Yeah. Yeah. What I do, things will catch my attention automatically. Mm-hmm. So we just uh, we just actually traveled, and I was talking to one of the podcasts I recorded when I was on the road was with a SWAT officer who spent a lot of time undercover. And you want to talk about people who have to be tuned into their environment, right? Because they're basically a chameleon. Yeah. And he was talking about, you know, the hair's going up on the back of your neck or just certain behaviors. And for me, it, 
that is probably something that I can't control that I notice now. But body language is something that always registers with me. Yeah. Like we were on the plane and this guy, probably fine, right? You know, he's probably a totally normal person, large person, overweight, sweating a little bit, probably because he's overweight, maybe was a little bit late, you know, mm-hmm. for the plane. But then he sits down and he just really starts, you know, moving around way too much and he's digging in his bags. And I was only watching it out of the corner of my eye, but it registers. So I'm like, something is going on with this guy. And then I'm like, okay. Then the the active part of the brain kicks in. I'm like, okay, do I handle this in his seat or do I handle this in the aisle? Do I push this dude forward to the front of the plane or do we just take care of this right here? Now, now, of course, nothing ended up happening, but I cannot shut off that portion of my brain. Yeah, that's automatic for us. Yeah. It's automatic. Now, I don't act on it. Yeah. But I also... You're prepared to act on correct. it. Correct. Yeah. And I also cannot not see that movement. I was literally reading a book and I just noticed, I'm like, that movement is abnormal for somebody who is in a relaxed state. This person is in an agitated state. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going to pay a little bit more attention. I think that, you know, a lot of that comes from just natural and passive observation. Like if you're a glass in this hillside, you're looking for things that are outside the pattern. Yeah. And so when you're even running... Tactical movement, people slightly lowered that, in their center of gravity. That's it, anything. Yeah. And, and, and... I think that's what happens is we have so many experiences of observing, being conscious observers, right? Which is hugely different than just glancing or staring into, you know, space unconscious. Well, you can look at something, but you need to see it. You have to There's see There's a it. difference between the two. Yeah, we're, we're making a conscious connection. We're imprinting things in our brain. But all it takes is that one indication. You know, you see that, that black tail or that white tail, and immediately you start paying or you see movement, and then you start honing. And so... Even in an environment like an airplane, which has happened to me, and that was a long story, but I was in a circumstance where I saw movement, it caught my eye, then I started becoming a very conscious observer. Then I'm taking in information, developing courses of action. And for a lot of people, they, they, I get asked all the time, they're like, well, why would you create that kind of paranoia or that level? It's not paranoia. It's not paranoia. Preparation. It's preparation, and it's so easy it's like uh, it's like doing a five paragraph op order. We have the structure and the and the formation. So for us to ad lib and just take information and plug it in, it's easy for us. We streamline the process. Yeah, and so I'll go and you know I don't go into restaurants. I'm like, stay here, children. I must identify each of the exits. That's dumb. <laughs> and people dumb. do do, do they that all do. The time. They do. They get yeah. well. They get over the top. So, but the thing is, I just I pay attention, and I've worked. I've played angles for long enough that I pay attention to them. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I I, I look at my entire environment outside and inside in fact on the way up here um there's a semi truck in front of me and this dude had a uh, we were going like 60 70 miles an hour and you know my truck it, i got a 14 inch lift on 37s in my truck you're rolling pretty high up there you <laughs> yeah. might have been eye level with the semi truck. I, I am typically i am <laughs> so i'm behind him and then i i i see the sheet of ice roll off the canvas and it flies to the air and i'm like well, that's a pretty big sheet of ice and it smashes on the side and then I'm like, okay, that's one. If there's any more, I'm going to start backing off. And then as he comes around a corner, another piece slides off, and it hits the ground so violently. I was like, man, if there was a person right there, they'd be dead. And so I back off, and then right, a, a state trooper drives by. And then right when he drives by, a piece comes off and lands right behind his patrol car. It, he, didn't, he, didn't, he must yeah. not have seen it. But I'm thinking like little things like that, yeah. even in non-tactical situations, just natural disasters or potential disasters, if you're not paying attention, you, you just make a mistake and then you die. I mean, that's how easy it is. Well, you're also forced into a reactive mindset. What you're talking about is positioning yourself into a place where you can be proactive. Exactly. And the difference in survival, and like let's just look at it in a gunfight. The difference between ambushing somebody or being ambushed, fuck me. Completely different. There's a yeah. difference, right? Yeah. And you can get out of an ambush, yeah. but what do you have to do to get out of an ambush? Overwhelming fire maneuver. And what does that do? That puts the other party on the reactive side, and yes. now you are being proactive. Yeah. Action's always faster than reaction. And, and you know, I, <laughs> I remember the first time I was in combat and killed a dude. I, he was behind a door, and he was hiding behind the door. And immediately... I reacted so fast because I had no time to think that I didn't get an opportunity to look through my optic. I didn't get an opportunity to, to really align my gun with my eye. I had a 10.5-inch barrel. I used that barrel unsuppressed to pry open a door that he was hiding behind, so there was no time. So as I just reacted and flicked the safe to semi and started gunning him down, 
after I did the after action on that, I'm like, man, this whole process that we teach people to look at a circumstance that might be a paper target in training that has hands that have something bad, and then we process that information, and then we manipulate our gun to our eyes, and then we look at our EOTech, and we make sure that we uh, account for our hold off, and we break those shots. It doesn't happen like that in real life because we don't have the time in most circumstances. Only if you have the distance, we have the time. That's it. If, yeah. you're, if you're moving surreptitiously, surreptitiously to a breach point and you have your mates with you and they're picking up slivers of the pie and you're behind your optic because you're offensive and you're deliberate, then yeah, you have the opportunity. But in this reactive state, you, you just don't have time to do a lot of things that people have talked about you do. And I've never understood it. I, I've gotten tactical arguments over it. And what I find most often is the people who argue never have killed anybody or never been in the gunfight reactively in real life. Yeah. And you, you confirm that bias one time and then you realize I've interviewed hundreds of police officers and dozens of my own teammates that everybody experiences the same thing. Cause you have one option. It's you can give them the gas and live to fight another day, or you could try to manipulate your gun and align something consciously being satisfied with that solution and then by the time you get to probably the second part of that, it's too late. Yeah, and I think if you give them, and again, you know, distance plays into this as well, too, for your Absolutely. reaction time. Yeah. And up close, if you give them the gas, it will actually buy you the time. So as you are gunning, you can align yes. your sights yep. and buy you that time. Because, again, you're proactive. Yes. Whereas that person is responding to the gas that you're giving them. And then your odds, I mean, if you just look at it from a math perspective, your odds are looking awesome. Yes. Their odds are looking like a cliff. Yes, and, and I think that's so important. And that we, li we actually line that out as the evolution of a gunfight. Because I, if I'm aligned and I have the gun oriented in the direction of the, the bad guy, and I have to react because my barrel is... It's like the Apache gunship, right? The Apache gunship has a monocle uh, aiming sight on the guy's eye who's the weapons mate, who's linked his gun system to his thumb. And then when he orients his head, the gun manipulates where his eye is. That's because if he sees a guy on the edge of a ridge line about to shoot an RPG up a Chinook's ass, he could react sooner as soon as he does the observation stage or the PID stage. Of oh, I can't even imagine guy. trying to slave that manually. Can you imagine? Like, no. It, under stress because you know it's, he's about to take down a CH-47. Yeah, because you'd have to do winded elevation and forward oh, movement yeah. at the same time. Yeah. The, the in, intuitive nature of that, you know, we talk about flow state, but being tapped – and being like a, a part of something mechanical when it feels like us, that's the same feeling I think we had when I had an M4 aligned. And I was in short proximity and distance, and my reaction was breaking a shot. Yeah. Right? That's my first. It wasn't, oh, shit. It was, oh, shit, pop. Yeah. And then as I'm breaking the shots, I'm aligning and driving my gun offensively, trying to upgrade my situation or scenario by bringing the optic to my, my eye. Yeah, you're you're still getting it to the proper shooting position. You're just doing some things along the way. Exactly. Did you guys, uh, we would actually practice often um, shooting without, like instinctive fire, essentially, where you're that close, you know, pistol driving with your thumbs, you know what I mean? Yeah. Up close, because, you know, you can start shooting the second you're out of cleared leather. Yes. You can orient your pistol, and I'm not saying you're going to be knocking the freaking, the dime out of an X-ring. Yeah. But like you said, you can give them gas. Yeah. And then it's as the hands come together, guess what? You can still be shooting. Yep. And then maybe the last sight picture you get, you're done shooting, but you're at least oriented on the threat. Yeah, that's so important. I, Same we, thing with the rifle. We would do that a lot of the time, too. It would be so close or so fast, you would instinctively shoot, and then you would finish with your sights aligned the way that it should be. Was that on the teams, or was that on the JSOC side? Uh, I think I experienced it first on the JSOC side, but when I went back to uh, the teams, I did my last rotation in 2010 with Team 3. It was yeah. part of the training. That's that's what I love to see because that full circle thing. Cause, Which is actually part yeah. of the mission statement of JSOC. You know, yeah. development group is legitimately they're tasked with yeah. developing. I mean, I remember wearing half shell uh, ballistic helmets two, three years before it made it down to the conventional teams or the body yeah. armor, or uh, you know, cry the AOR one. Nobody yeah. was or multi cam all that stuff. That to me, I love seeing that. Yeah, I, I think it's you know, combat application is the same group is the yeah. same scenario and the same infrastructure but it when it comes full circle i love to see the training apparatus as well yeah a lot of the teams uh, at the groups don't get the opportunity to see that training thing and i did see that jsoc but also when it was taken back i've seen the sifs do it and some of the teams do it and um well that stuff should be passed down because there's no there's no actual 
line item expense to it. I know it's you free. already have the ammo. Yeah. You already have the range time. You already have the guns. Yeah. What now you're talking about is you're you're aggregating information instead of equipment. Yeah. But I mean, there are even in the community I come from, there's some people like this is my tactic. Yeah. This is this is how we do it over here. I hate that. Man. Like, hey, dick bag, yeah. we're all gonna be. We're on the same fight, man. <laughs> well, I might be on the same objective with you potentially one yeah. day, and you want me to be honed up on these skills. Yeah, and if I see you not yeah. paying attention, I'm gonna kick you in that little shit river. Yeah, that's and it. Be like, I'm sorry, I tripped. My bad. <laughs> uh, booby traps, they're all over. I, I think it. I think it's comical. I mean, I, I've been. You know, I'm a. I guess you can call me part of my. What I teach is tactics, but now I have guys who teach tactics. I don't. I don't do a lot of it, but. Guys in the community used to attack me and be like, why would you teach civilians that? I'm like, bro, I'm not teaching them HR. I'm teaching yeah. them how to manipulate a firearm in defense of their life or their family's life. And then I always reference, if I'm allowed to go deploy overseas and train a foreign country and enable them in every way, find, fix, finish, the operational cycle, uh, equip, mentor, advise, it's like I'm doing that for them to defend their countries, which means defending their lives and their families' lives, but you have a problem with me teaching somebody to defend their life and self-defense. And I'm like, own. well, we don't teach them everything. I'm like, yeah, no shit, I'm not teaching them everything either. It's crazy. Yeah. I had a guy recently who saw a video of mine, and I won't call him out, but I, I will tell you he's from a unit that I served in, from the unit I served in, and uh, he said, he's like, bro, what are you teaching them? I'm like, I'm teaching them a way to think about fundamentals and self-defense. He goes, that's not what we taught. That's not what, how we learned. I'm like, bro, these guys are not operators yeah. in a special operations unit. I have to change the, the archetype and the way in, I disseminate the information. They're not even military. Some people don't even understand the context of what a firearm in relation to your hand or your eye or any of that means. So I have to start bare level. And he's like, oh, I would just think that you would focus on the basics that we focused on and I'm like, it's the military. Yeah. It's not the same, man. You have to be a multi-tool when it comes to teaching people outside of the military because you don't know their defined end state either. Yeah. I mean... You're absolutely right. It, and let's be honest, everything is evolving to include teaching methodologies. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. um, I got taught to teach, you know, to dive open circuit twin 80 scuba tanks. Jacques Cousteau could have retired that fucking technology... <laughs> in the 1960s, right? Yeah. And they're still teaching it in largely the same way with the guy, the same regulator only because you can tie knots in it. Yeah. There's better ways to teach people how to dive. There's better equipment that you can teach them on. And the people you're teaching will be better served if you evolve with the information too. Absolutely. Everybody, I think a lot of people don't understand that just because our community produces war fighters doesn't mean that we are set up to be teachers. I actually think far fewer people who have successfully made it through the pipeline can articulate and teach well. A yeah. small percentage of the people, yeah. there is a difference, and I see this in every physical skill, whether it's martial arts or skydiving or shooting a gun. There are those who are incredibly proficient and can teach, and then there are those who are incredibly proficient. Mm -hmm. And if you can't teach, I actually think you have less, you still have a value, both, but I think the person who can teach and articulate and raise up another group of people has far more value than just the operator who's only good behind a gun because you're going to time out eventually. Yeah. Or yeah. you might get hurt or you might get, comp you know, you, you're going to go break your leg. Like, hey, dude, you're off for six months. What are we going to do with you? You can't teach. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember uh, operating early on in the GWAT with uh, SEAL teams from the West Coast and a lot of the, the, the young guys wanted to they only wanted to do unilateral ops, which was part of what we were doing. Yeah. But we were doing CT FID, counterterrorism, foreign internal defense, essentially training people in direct action, hostage rescue, SR, et cetera, and then going out and doing the ops with them, which to me is, is the most satisfying part of the job. Like if I had to train, I've never been, I've never done a J set, which is this uh, basically a training mission. Um, I've always done combat and, and warfare each every year that I served in special operations, and I just got lucky timing-wise. Mm -hmm. But part of that cycle was going in, teaching, and then operating, right? And then f coming back full circle and fixing the things that they messed up and making them an actual better fighting force for that. But everybody wanted to kick in doors unilaterally, and I always told people who, 
you know, sometimes got a, who got offended that they were associated with us as Green Berets in training, that eventually it's going to dry up. And then global pursuit and the access to global pursuit across the world, how we get in is we train. Yeah. And so the same guys who were naysaying me a decade before are now in all across the continents, uh, the problem continents, which is every continent has a problem. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we should probably start listing the ones that don't. That would be the shorter list. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so everybody is doing that now. They're going in, they're, they're working with liaisons, with State Department training. It's interesting, yeah, because you look at both theaters when it first kicked off. Um, I went, I finished selection early. We cleaned up the tail end of the Cars Eye detail. We got there after he had Mm -hmm. been shot at. So it was largely handing it over to Dynacore, which should be known worldwide for their amazing handlebar mustaches. Yeah. Those dudes, I'm not, that's all I can really comment on was their handle. I'm going to leave it at that. (laughs) They had some fucking legit stashes. And then rotated over for OIF1. So I got to see both theaters pretty early. Yeah. And yeah, it was unilateral at both. And then you see the partner force creep in. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, one to five, one to 10. And at the JSOC level, it's one to go fuck yourself, right? It was like, (laughs) but then go back to 2010, it was one to one. Yeah. At convention, at Team Three. That was by paper. I mean, there were some ways that you could articulate and navigate around that if you needed to. Like, you know, if you're load limited on helicopters. You know, stuff like that. You cut away. You could cut away a little bit. There was a slight tolerance for it. But then, you know, I talked to my buddies over still on the JSOC side of the house, and now they have a dedicated partner force as well, too. Mm. So like you said, it's kind of the keys to the kingdom. I, I, I st- so I started operating um, in JSOC with the Afghan partnering unit. This is Afghan specific, but we had that was our partnering force. It was stood up by uh, the Ranger Regiment, um, and then... I remember seeing the email of the JSOC commander. It might have been the CSM saying everybody will have buy-in, meaning you will provide packs to go, people to go train these guys and run their selection and run their mm-hmm. – because the Rangers were just eating it. Nobody wanted to mess with them. And I've I've heard these stories. I've been involved with guys of, you know, obviously at that – level doing unilateral operations when you integrate an indigenous host nation where there's a lot of unknowns you don't trust them yeah. you haven't had enough time to trust yeah, them. there's an inherent level of distrust yeah and so when i when i ran apu uh on the objective i knew like the rapport building cycle because i was a green beret but a lot of guys didn't understand that they're like why you, is mike did you learn that in the training pipeline or where did you learn that in the training pipeline for okay. sure yeah i think it starts with small unit tactics where you're just honing the skills, but then there's blocks where you're honing skills and teaching. And then it culminates in Robin Sage where you're in this fake environment. You know, you jump into the back country of North Carolina and your endage could be West Point cadets. Um, Isn't like a whole town in on that? Whole t- Dude, <laughs> the most insane shit I've ever done in my life. Was it Robin Sage? Robin Sage. I jumped a 120-pound ruck as an 18 Bravo uh, machine gunner. We infilled all day. I hit, uh, I think for my culmination, we did a hostage rescue on a radio station. I shotgun breached a glass door. And I remember running up to this, and there was, <laughs> this is the craziest shit, there's people in lawn chairs drinking beers off the back of their pickup trucks <laughs> watching this whole thing. And when I got out, we're running to the, the breach point. It was like a mobile assault. And I look over, and I'm, my OC is right behind me because he's observing me do this breach. And, you know, the observer controller is trying to manage the crowd, but he's looking at me. And I look at him, and I'm like, do you want me to still go? Like, the because pe- I, I didn't yeah. comprehend. Like, I've what never f- seen a training <laughs> environment like this. Are we still okay? <laughs> Dude, it looked like a <laughs> flea market. And so I get up to this door, and I, I go to breach it. And I'm, I'm looking at him, and some of the people are kind of close. And he's like, breach it, breach it. So he gives me the commands to breach it. So I smash this glass door, and it blasts glass everywhere, which – yeah, I wouldn't have done in real as life. As glass doors do. Yeah, as glass doors do. And I'm like, am I, am I supposed to be doing this? So I open it up. The next door, I do a, a mechanical breach. I, I, I use a sledgehammer. We make entry. We do a hostage rescue. We get into a, a scenario where we only have a horse trailer and a vehicle. So we exfil with a horse trailer. I'm on the back of a horse trailer with a saw. So I got a 249 that's, that <laughs> one of the guys had in the back of it. <laughs> We, we start driving down the road, and I see these lines. It's like this road is a designated NASCAR strip. It's like a, a, there's people in lawn chairs and tailgating off the back of their truck. And so they know what's going on. I have no idea. 
a cop rolls up on us and we're in a pursuit. And so I'm in the back of this. There's people behind me, right? So I'm, I'm trying, you know, the whole know your target, what's beyond your target. Yeah. The cop car pulls up and I'm like, dude, my brain can't comprehend what's happening. He pulls out a gun and he points it at me and, and he's shooting blanks out of his M9 pistol. Uh, in, a, in a blatantly <laughs> civilian police car. In a blatant civilian police oh, car. Oh, man, this is grating against like every rule you've ever, you're just like, ah. Dude, my brain, I, and so I'm like, do I shoot? And there's people behind him. There's no OC with me. So I'm like, well, here we go. So I stuck the saw we had, and had blank rounds, dumped a hundred round nut sack of, uh, of ammo through the grate of this horse trailer. He's looking right at me. <laughs> and the, the only indication that I was doing the right thing is he looks at me and he's like, yeah, yeah. He's like smiling. <laughs> and I'm like, so I dump this hundred rounds. I throw this down. My M4, dump a 30 round mag, go to that, pull out this M9, which shoots wads with this, uh, with these blanks, empty that, put it down. And I go to reload my M4 and he's behind us and it, it bleeds off. And after it's all said and done, I'm like, I can't believe that's legal. I can't believe that whole thing was real. Like we just did that for real. Uh, <sighs> I mean, yeah, you're talking Crazy. mixing civilian and military role players. Oof. How, how many years have they been doing it there? Because obviously that's not the first time people came out to tailgate. It's not. And it, 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 historically, which, you know, there's, there's portions of this that are broken out all through like Rockingham and, and rural parts of North Carolina. It's been decades. It's been done for decades. And it's, and it's pretty traditional in those towns. In fact, as part of some of the scenarios, like one of the scenarios, I worked with a chicken farmer and put up conduit and inside of his chicken hen or his chicken uh, structure. I'm like, man, this feels kind of weird because I'm doing this work, but there's no tactical play here. And then all of a sudden, right at the end of like a six-hour shift of doing this with me and my partner, these civilians roll up that are aggressors, and he's like, hey, you guys need to hide. So we break off in the woods, and I'm like, oh, so that's what this was. That was the rapport building right there. That yeah. Was, yeah, it was a rapport building, and, and he, trust, he trusted us. We trusted him. But anyways, this whole scenario, um, they've been doing forever in, in uh, a mythical place. It's called Pineland is the name of it. They give you fake cash. The town, they pay off the town. The t everybody <laughs> in the town knows what's going on. You don't know what's going on. But they've actually had a scenario there where uh, a student was killed. Really? Yeah, it was, it was a it was a because I had been through them. It was a police checkpoint. They had a police officer who was new. They hadn't informed him of what oh, they did. No. It's, this is uh, it's horrible because the guy is in the back of the truck under a tarp, and he thinks that this is part of the scenario. He's one of the students, and the cop is asking for license registration, and the cop all of a sudden sees the tarp move, and he draws his gun. Probably a real one. A real gun, yeah. And, the, and then so the student's not like thinking this is part of the play. So he grabs his bag, and he breaks contact, and as he's stripping the bag, he's putting his M4 together because they used to make us break down our M4s I'm thinking partly because of the lull in time it gives you just in case something like that does happen. Yeah. Um, but also just for concealability. And he was, he took his M4 out in front of the cop. Well, he's like, put your hand, let me see your hands. And he continues to assemble it. Oh, fuck. And then he gets shot and killed. Fuck. And I'm like, what? It, it changed a lot of the parameters. After that, they started getting strenuous. I, I'm, I'm thankful we didn't stop, but that was fucking horrible. Tragic. <sighs> Yeah, that's what happens when the information does not pass to the lowest level. I know, that's crazy. Can, Fuck. Can you imagine that cop? I mean, it sucks for the dude who got killed, but that cop. He'll, be, he'll carry that burden for the rest oh of his man. life, for sure. He shot and killed an American service member who was just trying to train to kill yeah. bad guys in combat. Yeah, there's no winners in that situation, for sure. And I'm glad, also, that they didn't shut that training down. Yeah. Because I could see... It could easily, right? Yeah. Very, very easily, depending on who was at the apex of that decision. I mm -hmm. could see that going both ways, and that would have... If they shut that down, imagine how that would have changed the community. Oh, detrimental. Because that, that was the one course that I went through where it's like you're looking for value, and that was it. I was like, that's, that's what this whole experience was about. I think that's truly what separates us um, from the other services of special operations. Why did you decide to join the military? You know, I, my dad, it's, it's funny. I wanted to be a SEAL. My dad was Army. Um, grew up in a military family. My uncle, my uncle Joe, was retired Navy. And I remembered, I was at my grandma's house. I was probably seven or eight years old. And all this, the Charlie Sheen stuff was out. 
I had, you know, fucking Charlie Sheen, crazy. <laughs> As I was, you know, I, I I was just like, man, I I want to fall from the sky rise and to crash through glass and be tandemed or tethered to something and shoot a bad guy with the one handed with an MP5 ST. Correct. Just one handed. All rounds were accurate. Right on, right in the face, <laughs> right in the ski mask. Um, I, I was just enthralled with that and. I was fascinated with the water as well. I mean, I, I played GI Joes in the bathtub and make them do underwater ops at the drain. Those kind of things. Yep. I'm sure you could relate. Oh, <laughs> believe me, I had all the GI Joes because there was like a UDT character. There was a diver. I had all those. Guys. Oh yeah, yeah. And so I, I, at some point, I asked my uncle and I said, "Hey, I want to join the Navy." And he understood because I think at one point he even wanted to be a Navy SEAL. And he said, "You realize that the Navy, if you." go through that training pipe or if you go to that training and you fail you become needs of the navy and he he worked on like the uss forestall like some old school uh sh- battle carriers and ships and he said most of the people who did the labor on my boat were washouts from the seal program because they're undesignated yeah they it, don't have they didn't have a job they didn't have a job <laughs> they had to change that because there were so many and you can imagine a guy who enters with that as their desire and career path yeah it doesn't make it you're gonna have a discipline problem on oh, your hands huge and then they're unskilled it was basically from what i heard was like here's your paintbrush you're on an aircraft carrier you will paint the port side Oof. from the front to the rear then you'll paint the starboard side from the rear to the front and you will continue that for four to six years. it's almost like it's a punishment right <laughs> it's almost like you you wash out so they're just going to punish you for your enlistment well and it's exactly what you said needs the military yeah and the military needs people on paint guns and paint chippers and yeah, I mean those those fleet vessels. I know very little about them, other than the fact they require constant maintenance. Oof. Yeah, I didn't want to be a maintainer. No, I didn't want to be a support guy. So then I actually asked my dad about it, and he told me about special forces, and he said you want to be a green beret. That's what you want to do. And I I I, th- I remember this. I, I remember the moment I was driving in. We were driving in this Pinto. Um, my dad had some baller classic vehicles. Vehicle. Yeah, classic. <laughs> it's like a death trap. Um, but he he said, hey, you need to go into SF. And I said, if I, because I was all tripped out about this MP5 SD and because of Charlie Sheen. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the gun that I need. Don't get me wrong. I've had some goddamn good times with an MP5 SD. Yeah. But then you rapidly come to the realization it's good for like squirrels and rats. Yeah. And lights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah taking and out it's lights. quiet and you can put it on full auto and like the sights barely raise and you're like... Man, this is a nine mil round. You can almost see the rounds coming out of the gun. <laughs> yeah. It's like a Sims gun. You just see the rounds dancing. Yeah, you're like, I don't, I don't <laughs> want to take this into anywhere where we're going to be, you know, engaging with seven six two or any other. <laughs> yeah, that's not. It's not a great gun for that. And no. um, I bet him one of those guns and said, I'm going to go into SF. And it was my incentive, right? I had a, I created a vision and a focus like that MP5, and it, and I just at 17 I went in the infantry with. The idea just to do my best in the infantry, get a good baseline, and then immediately go SF. So I went SF right after 9-11. What year did you join? 97. Okay, I was in 96. Yeah. I was in that delayed entry program in 96. Same. Yep, and then, yeah. and then did the whole thing at 97. Yeah, I joined when I was a junior in high school through the delayed entry program. Yep, that's what I did, yeah. And uh, have you come to the realization yet all we did was hook a recruiter up? Because you still got to be 18 and have your high school diploma. Oh, yeah. So we basically yeah. filled the heartbeat requirement. That's it. <laughs> You're just a guy with a heartbeat. You just get a number. They're oh. like, sweet. We uh, we got what we need for this month. Because you still got to be, like I said, you got to get your you know, yeah. high school diploma or GED. So you went infantry and then uh, talk, what, just walk me through your career, like the, so the I went navigation to, of it. Yeah, I went, I mean, I went SF and I wanted to be a ranger. That's the first thing I want to do. I kind of got screwed out of that deal. In basic training, because I didn't, I didn't realize there's infantry designations like eleven hotel, eleven Mike, you know, mortars, heavy anti armor. Um, uh, there used to be mechanized, mm-hmm. and then a regular infantryman. They they've since got rid of all that shit. I only know Delta, Charlie, and Bravo. Yeah, those I understand. Yeah, we send our corpsman to eighteen Delta. Yeah, and the Bravos are the guys who are like, hey, that thing goes boom. You need to talk to that dude. Yeah, that's it. And then the Charlies are the communicators, right? That they are. There they are. Go. So beyond, they, beyond that, everything you guys talk about is fucking gibberish to me. Yeah, man, it's crazy. <laughs> well, it's, I, I think it's funny that uh, later down the road, I, I realized that there was more a lot of similarities between how an ODA detachment and a SEAL platoon are organized. Where I didn't realize 
because I thought there was just unilateral door kickers. I didn't think, all. I didn't realize you could take pass and, you know, you could be a medic, you could be a Calm sniper. guy, JTAC, sniper. Crazy. Could, yeah, it's the same thing, yeah. yeah. And, and you, you know, you'd break up into mutually supporting positions because you you had to have overlay and skill sets. So you had to have X number of corpsmen, X number of comm guys, JTACs. Yes, yeah, it's, it's very similar. Like I said, I think the communities are defined by their similarities, not the differences. Yeah, I like that. And when I, you know, I went in and I immediately want to be a, a weapons guy, which is the Bravo, because I, I just like guns. And I thought with a Ranger tab and, you know, I had an expert infantry badge. I was just an infantryman that could get into that. And... But before that, in the infantry, uh, I was a tomb guard for a couple of years. So I guarded the Tomb of the Unknowns. Unexpected to me, right? Because I thought I was going to be a grunt in the woods, in, in the dirt, in the mud. Did you have to apply for the uh, Tomb of the Unknown soldier? I did. I did. That had to have been an insane experience. The most insane. The hardest experience I've ever had in the military. Really? Hands down. Hands down. Just in the, uh, I mean, I've, I've seen documentary. I've been there in person. I've seen documentaries, but you want to talk about the amount of military discipline and preciseness with the movement or the uniforms. I'm, Crazy. Yeah, it, it seems it's the highest level of discipline that it seems that you can exude as a human being. It is. Uh, one of the lines, it was line six of the Sentinel's Creed says, my standard will remain perfection. And, and that's instilled in you every single day. The most difficult thing about it, and uh, you know, if it, when asked... It's like, why would that be so more difficult than special forces selection or unit selection? It is because it's a seven to nine month selection process. So at the end of nine months, you could just be messing up and, or substandard, not perfect. And they'll just DX your ass. They'll just shit can you. And there's been guys that have done that. And so for seven to nine months, which is the average it takes to earn the tomb identification badge, you have no life. Like I work a fireman, a firefighter schedule, which is like day on, day off, day on, day off, day on, day off, and f- and then or that last cycle was four days off. But every in between off day, you're prepping your weapon, you're shining your damn shoes, you're rouging the brass with a with a wheel, um, polishing all all your brass. Luckily, I only had like a one award, so I was good yeah. to go. But that attention to detail and that amount of discipline for such a long time, I think is what set, set the foundation for me militarily to just go in, go all in a hundred percent commit and not flail. Like I, I never, I didn't drink. I didn't, I didn't uh, go to bars, to clubs in between training sessions. I was rucking, you know, getting ready for Ranger school. Cause I was a tomb guard when I went to Ranger school, um, training, focused on small unit tactics and that was my life and and I was a really boring dude like I wasn't a fun guy to hang out with because <laughs> everybody's like going to club shotgun and beers and I'm putting on a ruck yeah to, to go PT but I'd imagine that discipline and all the stuff you had to do didn't end once you were selected I mean you had to hold and maintain that level of discipline yeah I mean I've been there when there's that's a packed crowd you know watching yeah. the change of the guard mm-hmm. it's uh there's got to be a lot of pressure associated with that Especially as a young man. I mean, yeah. I remember the first time they call it a, a, a noon walk, right? It's a high noon walk. And it's, a, it's an important time in a tomb guard's career because you have to earn that. And they have this, I think the, the way doctrinally they, they build tomb guards and the way they train tomb guards is really cool. Um, you had to earn everything. So nothing was given. And it was an honor for you to earn that. So... You had to have special information on Arlington National Cemetery. You had to have certain things memorized. You had to be physically fit. And then every hour on the hour, I I believe it was 15 minutes before the hour, you had to be in a corner. And I can't remember too much in detail. It's been so long. But you had to say something and basically earn the right to go outside. And so they're at the window where it's 15 minutes before the hour. And the the guard has changed every hour on the hour during the wintertime and every 30 minutes in the summer. So in the summer, it's every 15 minutes you're up in this space, or every 30 minutes you're up in this space trying to earn a walk. And if you somehow earn a walk, um, it's usually early in the morning or in the late afternoon. Because if you mess up, they don't want anybody to see. Yeah, for sure. You're representing America. Oh, yeah. there's, there's cameras yeah. in your face. <laughs> 
Um, so the high noon walk, is that just occurs at noon, I'm assuming? So, yeah, the high noon walk is the highest amount of traffic during open hours, typically in the summertime. And so you'll get 2,000 people. Um, and the first time that I earned that walk, and, you know, this is 15 minutes before the hour, you have to do what's called a dress drill. And I, I think the standard was one minute. I believe it's one minute. So the time in which they say, get dressed, you're in physical training or greens uniform. You have to run downstairs and do a, a, a change of uniform into blues, ceremonial blues, in less than a minute. And so you, that's you, no easy task. It's insane. <laughs> it's insane. I'm very good at undressing myself. <laughs> uh, I could strip the shit. I off have velcroed once. every piece of clothing that I'm wearing. <laughs> so we, there's all tricks of the trade. You start learning the craft and then you come up. And then if you're up and you have your uniform tra- uh, changed, I remember the first time they said, you have the walk. And I was like, what? You know, I'm walking at noon. And so then I started getting jitters, right? I'm getting nervous. And when I walk out, to change the guard, I'm, I'm not the relief commander, so I'm not changing the guard, so I'm not doing the weapons inspection. I'm just the guy that's guarding. I, I go up and I have my, um, my M14, and it's at port arms, and it's got a bayonet on it, and I'm walking through the crowd, and people, I'm hitting people in the face with my, <laughs> with my bayonet. <laughs> I'm knocking hats off. Like People are like, oh, my God, my eyes. And I'm just breaking this crowd, and it's so many people, and I'm shaking. And so I go to, I go down to, I don't even know what to call it, from port arms to, to attention, and I'm holding the rifle with my hand, and I could hear the bayonet lug <laughs> and the bayonet <laughs> rattling. Yeah. And I'm just, and so I like pin it with my hand or my finger just so I can't do it, and I'm like hyperventilating. And I have aviator sunglasses on, but I look to the left and right, and everybody's eyes are just focused on me, like every single feature of my face and my uniform probably better not to look <laughs> yeah, <what? laughs> after, <laughs> throw some horse blinders on that thing <laughs> man after i looked at the crowd i just immediately looked forward and just like concentrate on your job and you know i got through it but that part of my career did it become easier the more walks you did absolutely yeah the more and, and what's crazy is the the better i got as a tomb guard and there's all these little intricacies that you figure out and you adapt to and like, if somebody saw me mess up, they probably wouldn't even know I messed up. But another tomb guard judging a new, another tomb guard, they would immediately identify flaws and, and sound the same thing we were talking about with patterns. Like, we can notice things that are jacked up. But the coolest part about that tour was after that tour, and this is pre GWAT. I mean, let's be honest, there was nothing going on in the military. Fucking it, tomb guard sounded like it was kicking. It, it was it. it that was <laughs> it. At the time, that was it. But it was painful in the regular army. As I'm sure it was every service. Oh, for sure. Um, the biggest fight at that point was for budget. That's it. And every and nobody had money for yep. anything. So we were just making the best with what we had. And so w- when I finished becoming a tomb guard, I got awarded the badge, uh, badge four seven zero, out of uh, uh, I guess it's like five six hundred now. Um, when I got my badge, I became a tomb guard and then learned it really well and then became a trainer. And so at a very young age, you know, I was a young sergeant in E5, Ranger qualified, Airborne qualified, Tomb Guard, and I was, you know, training E7s, certain first classes that wanted to be Tomb Guards. That taught me the baseline, I think, of what it took to be a Green Beret without me even realizing it. Because I just, at the time, wanted to kick doors in and shoot people in the face. Did you, have you ever gone back and watched? I have. Yeah. How is it with having all that experience in your belt now? It, it, you know, I, I let enough time go by, and purposely I did that, where I wanted to kind of take my way out of that circumstance where I was overthinking about judging the guard or yeah. thinking about stuff and focus on, you know, what it represents. Yeah, the which, ceremony The itself. ceremony and stuff. So when I went back, it was amazing because I was, I was, I believe, in JSOC at the time, and I was ab- about to deploy. No, no, I was a contractor at the time. I was a GRS guy at the time. And I was about to deploy, and I talked to the guys, and they were like, hey, man, what's up? Uh, tell us about you. And I told them about my background. And all those guys are super pumped and motivated about the military anyway. And they're all infantry guys for the most part, combat arms. It's like, oh, man, I, you know, tell me about SF. And they tell me about uh, working with the agency and all this cool stuff. And it got them pumped and hyped. And then I deployed immediately, I think, to Yemen or something like that, right after, like a couple of days later. But it was real good for me. And, and coming back to see all that. Because to be honest, in special operations, I never brought it up. Yeah. It, because it was, 
you were a toy soldier. That's what we they called us, and yeah. you weren't even real. But back then, and I maybe I say this just finally because I'm there's some mechanism in me that's kind of embarrassed over it when I shouldn't. I'm just being honest that I didn't want to tell people I was a toy soldier. Like I wanted them to know, like I was a. Uh, uh, an actual soldier who fought in warfare in, yeah. in the trenches. And it really, oddly enough, I almost spent my entire career because I kind of got ripped out of being a ranger initially, trying to prove to myself that I was worthy of being in combat arms or being a special operations guy inside of warfare and not a toy soldier, which I know sounds bad, but that's just a weird perspective on it. I think it's fascinating. The real question is, how often do you wear those aviators? Man. Don't don't tell me you don't have them. No, man, I could never do that. God damn it! I could, they could be your driving glasses, and they don't have the loops. <laughs> they, they're just straight back and That's they're what brass. I'm saying. Oh man, those could be your driving. Glasses. I, I went down that road once, and I was like, dude, I look like an idiot. <laughs> I'll never. And they changed them now. Now they're modern. They have like they might have like an Oakley contract or something weird. God damn it! And they're super high speed, but man, they were they were Top Gun. You could have glasses. gone back there to visit and said nothing but worn those and just looked at them and be like, yeah, inside. <laughs> <laughs> like, whoa, really? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Tomb of the Unknown Soldier Guard to after that, where'd you go? So. Uh, Right after I went to selection, I went, so I actually had a little break in service. Um, long story short, I got out September 3rd of 2001. and Poor timing. <laughs> the worst timing <laughs> on the planet. Uh, almost re-upped to go to Ranger Regiment, and the guy that I re-upped with, who I went to Ranger School with, jumped in with 3rd Battalion uh, in the Rhino DZ. And so I didn't do that. And then immediately realizing that, if I stayed out, I would be in the guard because I transitioned the guard and went to college. I fought every single means of uh, going back in and trying my hardest to get back in. And the military at the time didn't understand what that meant. They never saw a surge of prior enlisted guys trying to get back in. Yeah. And after 9-11, they, they learned that very fast. Um, so I did that, went back in, and immediately went through selection. And I had kind of like an 18 x-ray program where you come off the streets, they give you the opportunity. If you fail, your needs of the Army, which was no big for me. Yeah. It, it wasn't big for me because I would have been an infantry team leader, squad leader. You had enough experience at that point. Yeah, and You could also probably uh, look at that ratio or the odds of your success and be like, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Because when I you know looked at my peers, a lot of my peers, even in selection – you didn't need to have a lot of that. They didn't have a lot of time in the woods. They didn't have small unit tactics. They didn't have yep. line nav. So I went to selection. I was successful there. Became an 18 Bravo. Right after I got out of the Q course, I ended up going uh, to Afghanistan with a mountain team. And this is uh, four into five. And Operation Red Wings happened. Mm -hmm. I was on the Nuray side in Nuristan. Um, two, a couple of my teams went in, in QRF the, actually QRF that did the body recovery. We were what an utter and complete shit show. Insanely, insanely. You um, look back and it's a, it should be a lesson. It should be an, a, a, the nucleus of a star of lessons learned on failures. Yeah. From planning to preparation to execution. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I know they made a movie out of it and I'm not discounting anybody's heroism or what happened that day. But God damn it, that entire thing was avoidable. Yes, and it there's was. so many lessons that could have been learned from that. Uh, on the back side, which what's interesting is my detachment, which my company was deployed um, all the way up from, you know, I think we were in Asadabad, Jalalabad, Good all the way a down. A bad and J bad. A bad and J bad. <laughs> we occupied all those fire bases for that rotation, which wound up being a nine monther for us. But out there in those fire bases, I was in Naray. Um, our Halo team was in. Uh, Asadabad, and they got asked, and I'll never forget. Will the team sergeant was asked to do that operation, and he denied it. After they did, they did they they literally did a long form, um, isofac you know is isolation facility, and did detailed planning. Yeah, and in the planning, realized that if they were compromised, even as a detachment, that the chances of them exfilling or getting an X field was difficult because of the terrain yep. and they would be in a bad circumstance. So they passed the mission and then, you know, and let alone the fact that the individual was actually not that high value. Yeah. Yeah. You I've know. heard that too. So, um, 
Yeah, so it, it a lot of uh, factors that went into that, and they decided to to do it, and we were part of that whole deal, and that really shaped that whole rotation. We lost a lot of Chinooks that rotation. I think we lost three or four. Mm-hmm. We had an MH forty seven crash on one of our ops, and you know it, it was my first exposure to war, and I was digging it, man. I I realized all the deficiencies in me. Instead of exercising offensively all the things I thought I was good at. I realized that how much I sucked at a lot of things. Force protection, patrol base operations, running indige. Oh, man, if I can go back now, all the things I would have changed. So it made me hungry for it. Like, Because there was a decision point there where I could have did the Q course, did that first combat rotation with 3rd Special Forces Group at the time, and just hung it up. I could have got out and did whatever I wanted to do and decided I was committed to it. I, I loved war and... Um, th- was never going to get out of it as long as I could. What did you love about it? I I honestly love the simplicity. Um, I don't think there's anything complex about war. I think the reason that people who come back from war have the hardest of times, it, uh, part of is part of it is they're fucking lazy. They don't want to deal with real world issues. They don't have to pay bills, take care of their kids, um, emotionally support their wives. Um, do shit that normal people have to do. When you go to war, it's easy because the only thing you're focused on is training, war, operations, keeping your guys alive, and training, war, yeah. operations, keeping your guys alive, training, war. That's it. Yeah, the best cycle on the planet, and and so I fell in love with that. Not advantageous it's, for everything else in my it's life. It's seductive. It's so seductive. That process where you get back. And then, you know, you're, you're getting your train up or your FMP and you're getting ready for war. You just can't wait. But you don't tell anybody that. You, everybody who's in your lives, you're like, I'm going to miss you so much. But the reality is in the back of your head, you're like, fuck it. I cannot wait to get on that bus. I cannot wait to get on that C-17 and get overseas and get back to war. I don't think it's possible to explain that unless you've experienced it yourself. Mm-hmm. Because I felt the same way. I felt and probably will feel for the rest of my life torn about how I felt internally. Mm. I, uh, you know, there's that burden that I felt of, I have to go to every school that I can because people are relying on me to do my job. Mm-hmm. And then the other side of that coin is, I want to go to every school that I can. Because I agree with you, I don't think that, what I'll say is, I don't think the execution of war is complex. The reasons for a nation to enter into a war and all the things that go with that Highly complex, beyond my capability. But the execution of war, like you said, the decisions are not that hard. Many are rote. Mm -hmm. They're practiced. They're conditioned. The training is very good. And fuck, it feels good to win. Yeah. Part of that whole process, I mean, I started Philcraft Survival in my company based off that premise of, of that cycle of warfare or that cycle of operation where you go in and, and everything's the same because you've created a process. There's a structure. And people think that's chaotic. Like people think war is chaos. War is not really chaos when you operate at that high Yeah, a there's level. chaotic things going on around you, yeah. but you don't have to buy into them. 1,000%. Yeah, you don't have to be a part of that problem. Yep. And um, that was so uh, addictive in seeing the end result. And, and you know, I, as being part of a joint task force, I used to look at all the sit reps for all the, the tactical action arms that went on every night, including you guys and everybody in the uh, joint task force. And it became like an exercise and who can kill the most bad guys. And, and literally, this might have been a McChrystal thing because being part of Task Force 16 and the joint task force and JSOC and, and Iraq at the time, uh, we were tracking those kind of analytics, and the well, bo- better the analytics, the you won. Well, here's the thing, too. What other metric? It became the the most easily recognizable and tallyable metric. Yes. And I, yeah. I, what I will say is this: looking back, that's dangerous as all hell. So dangerous. Yeah. On, on an on an unfathomable scale. Yeah. Long term consequences, I think, both on the individual on the community, on the units, yeah, on the nation, perhaps? If you asked me to go in detail, I wouldn't say a word. But philosophically, when you, when you put people in a cycle like that where they disconnect from 
reality. It's almost like kids now with virtual reality where they think it is reality. Mm -hmm. I have uh, 84,517 friends. No, you have that many people tuned in virtually to (laughs) the data that you give them. When you start doing that in the war machine, which was highly effective, I mean, McChrystal's action arms, which include you got included you guys, uh, was highly effective in driving this almost foreign mindset in where you where you just go into it and decisions were made and you're like, man, am I okay with this? And sometimes you were, sometimes you weren't, but you're just operating at this very complex, but at your level, very simple, yeah. primitive state. And you know, and, and on that, I'll not take back any of my experiences in warfare. I won't either. I would describe yeah. it as the sharpest, like laser honed. As I don't, you know, unless there's some crazy Japanese way to sharpen a knife. Yeah, sharper than a laser knife. And when you have something that sharp, the bearer of that knife needs to be careful in the direction that they move it. Absolutely, that's how I would describe it. And I wouldn't yeah. take any back any of my actions as well. Um, cause they molded me good, bad and ugly and different and everything in between. Cause I saw, I mean, if I'm being honest, I saw some of the most beautiful things I've ever seen yeah. in war yeah. that I don't know if it's possible to fuck. I don't know if it's possible to match them. And I'm talking about like love, yeah. the love of somebody for somebody else and the actions that that person would take because of that love. Mm-hmm. People think that war is defined by hate. And I think there might be an aspect of that, but I was thinking about this. Uh, like a week ago, I was like, did I hate the people that we were fighting? Not really. There was actually an essence of respect because they were willing to pick up arms and fight for what they believed for as well. It was actually the absence of hate. Mm -hmm. I think if I hated them, I would have been less effective. I certainly didn't love them. I loved the people that I was with. I respected the fact that they believed enough to stand up for themselves and for what they believed in. I did not believe with their belief and did everything I could to exterminate every single one of them but somehow in all of that too, I saw the most beautiful things that I think I'll ever encounter my entire life. I, uh, on an objective once, I killed a dude who was a, a Libyan foreign fighter and he had an S vest. He had the whole shebang. And in one of his hands, he had a grenade. It pinned in his hand, prepared to clack off. And he had a S vest, full of nails, OG S vest. He had a solo boots, like pretty high speed boots at the time. Fucker had an internet connection somewhere. I know, dude. (laughs) Seriously. Um, He was just squared away. And I remember, I mean, I had no problem with shooting and killing him. That was just part of the job. But I remember taking his watch. And I'd never done this before. And I took his watch, and I still have that watch. And I took it because I wanted something to remind me of how much I respected him. Because... I looked at these guys, and, and, and here's what people probably need to understand in context. Depending on what unit you're in, depending on what service you're in, maybe even depending on, on what squad you're in in your unit will determine your experience in war. And they're not equal. They're not equal at all. Even they're not. In, even inside of those units, they're not yeah, equal. Yeah, even in the same unit, they're not. Yeah. You can get one troop in one, one place that sees no war. And they're at, you know, TGI Fridays, burning the midnight oil. And then you have a troop that's doing VIs and crushing souls. And what I gathered from that experience with that Libyan foreign fighter was that I respected, always have. It's, it's ingrained into me doctrinally by my Asian mother. But uh, <laughs> I think it's a the, culture thing. The man. earliest of doctrines. In the your earliest life. of doctrines. <laughs> she was very good at beating that in me. Um, but I've always respected the enemy, especially the ones that were willing to fight. Yeah. Now, the cowardice, and I've seen it, you know, I've TQ'd or tactically interrogated Al-Qaeda HVTs, and they're crying and all this stuff, and I'm like, man, these guys, these pussies. But when I see these dudes who are willing to fight for the ideology, it, it truly does, uh, it, it brings some kind of comfort to me knowing we're playing the same game and have similar ideologies. And and when so many people don't, I mean, when you look back at the military units that supported you, potentially, they might be even adjacent units that are supporting you. Though some of those units don't have that same ideology. So I think true warriors are, are that, that you define 
of having that respect. Because I've heard so many people who are mongers say, how could you respect the enemy? Fuck Al-Qaeda. And the first people who say that, like they say that openly, one, I know it's part of their ego and part of their identity. Or persona. Their persona, their virtue signaling. But another element to that is they haven't really experienced war like we've experienced war. Where to experience war where you respect your enemy, you have to come close to death um, or lose friends and teammates in that experience to truly gain that respect for the other side, it's, which is a beautiful thing. Yeah. It's hard to describe again unless... Yeah. Well, I, probably impossible to describe uh, unless you've lived that and felt that yourself. Yeah. I've, I've, heard, I've, I've had people call me out and say, how could you t- talk about war and make it seem like it's a, an epic and beautiful thing? War is hell. War is a tragedy. War yeah. is what you make it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It can be well. And you, and you, well, it depends on the lens too. Yeah. You know, I was uh, one of the things that stuck with me the most on my last deployment. We were in uh, <clears throat> Mogensen, so I did the first part of it in a fob out in Navajar, mm-hmm. and then I rotated back. I picked up a commission, uh, which is just proof that the military advancement system is broken. When I was a buds <laughs> instructor. <laughs> Because if they gave me a commission, somebody was asleep at the wheel. That's super rare, right? Yeah, I don't have a college degree. What? Yeah. <laughs> wow. That had to have been like an admiral. No, it was the LDL program, limited duty officer. Emphasis on the limited. And like, How many SEALs have done that? Um, I was the first E6 to get picked up in wow. that program. It was designed more for 7, 8, and 9, so chief, senior chief, and master chief, uh, because it was the same pipeline they go through the warrant program. Okay. So I don't think you guys have an LDO program in the army, but obviously a lot of the aviators are warrants. So I know that the warrant yeah. community exists. Yeah. Um, but you know, I was working my way through the enlisted structure, right? And you, these mandatory career wickets that you have to hit before you go for in the Navy. The big jump is E six to E seven, petty officer first class, to which chief, is the right? most fucking pathetic rank name. That's E six. Yeah, petty officer. It's like petty who officer. the fuck. First off, let's go heavy on the petty and really light on the <laughs> officer. All right. My favorite one's non-commissioned officer. You're not a commission officer. Yeah. We're just going to put the non. Yeah. You're just not commissioned. Petty officer. Who wrote that down was like, nailed it. <laughs> I mean, hey, an E3 in the Navy, seaman. <laughs> Another one that's classic when you call the quarter deck. And you're like, can you have a seaman stain? E3 stain report to the quarter deck. And that's how you'd always mess with the new guys because they would do it. And you'd hear them like... You know, semen stain, please. And then they'd be like, you hear the mic click off. They're like, God damn it. <laughs> oh, man. But uh, so I was going through the career wickets, and I got, I was with uh, A Squadron at CAG yeah. when I got shot. We were doing a cross training deployment, and I was doing my LPO tour, the leading petty officer tour, which yep. is a mandatory. That's a hard stop. If you do not have that completed, you're not picking up E7 because, you know, the guys take the written test. And they stack all the records. And you can basically separate them. LPO tour complete. We're going to take a look at you. Non-LPO tour. Whoosh. Wow. And uh, so I got medevaced out on my LPO tour. And it was counted as incomplete. So what? Yeah. They counted it as incomplete. Because I didn't successfully complete my LPO tour. You have to be shitting me. I'm dead serious. So I got to Bud's as an E6. And um, there was, you know, I put in for chief when I first got there. Screen negative. I was like, huh. Like my... My military record doesn't suck. I think I'm doing pretty good amongst my peers. I'm like, all right, whatever. Maybe it was a bad year. Next year, took the test. Screen negative. I'm like, what in the actual fuck? And I got a hold of a guy who was on the board. He wasn't supposed to say shit about it because yeah. he's supposed to be very behind the doors. He's like, dude, I saw them take your record, and they're like, they didn't even go look beyond the LPO go, no go. And I was pissed, but I wanted to stay in the military. And, of course, when I checked into Bud's, it was a two-year tour, but they already had an LPO. And you have to have the LPO tour for a year for it to count. Yeah. There was like three dudes in line. Whoa. So I would have had to go to the bottom of the line. I was like, no. Yeah. So I started researching it. And I stumbled across the LDO program. And it's designed for, you know, I was a line officer, but I wasn't supposed to be in tactical command. Like, that's not the actual designation of it, but I wore a star on my sleeve. So I was a line officer. Like, I did fall into the actual rank structure. Yeah. So it's not like a warrant. You're an actual officer. I was an actual line officer, yeah. Not a warrant. So, and I was looking at it, and it's like, well, this is traditionally for E7s, E8s, and E9s. About 30 people will apply per year. They've since shut it down because there's actually, in the SEAL community, 
uh, there was almost no participation. It's not a well-known program. They don't publicize it much. Uh, and so I put my package in, and I was up against all these chiefs, and I got selected number one out of the what? year. So I got to put 01 on first, which is a joke because, like, September 30th, I was an E6, and I just yeah. went to the exchange <laughs> and talked to this lady. I was like, I need all the officer uniforms immediately. <laughs> And October 1st, I'm just like, oh, I'm ants and stuff. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, walked over to my buddy. I'm like, do I have this shit on right? <laughs> He's like, dude, your belt's backwards. I was like, fuck. Because I never wore dress uniforms and I was wearing a set of khakis. But it was all off the merits of my service record. So yeah, really? I have no college degree. And then in 2010, I got commissioned. I was at Bud's. I went a literal nine iron golf shot down the road to SEAL Team 3. And the CEO was like, hey, we're going to make you the training officer and you're going to oversee all the training. I was like, yeah, roger that. And I was still kind of rehabbing from an injury. And then they were going to task a uh, a task unit to go over to Afghanistan. And I'm talking to the skipper. He's like, we don't have anybody in this task unit that's ever set foot in Afghanistan. So you're now going to go with them. I was like, yeah, roger that. And I was going to be the operations officer. And then one of the AOICs, the assistant officer in charge, his wife was pregnant. So he was going to go late, and they were having serious problems with that platoon's OIC. And the wow. skipper, the skipper was like, "You are now the <laughs> okay. AOIC. You're going to deploy with them." That so escalated I, quickly. Yeah. So I did like the last two, three months of. Uh, he's like, "You're not the AOIC, but we're going to put you over there in that role." I didn't have the official role, but uh, I did the last few months of the training, and then deployed with them. And then out the door, as I was leaving, the skipper handed me Lieutenant Bars, like Captain Bars in the Army, because I was still an O one. Nice. He's like, "Here you go." Which I upgraded overseas was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking with Jocko about this. I'd throw on like 0405 if I needed to for meetings. <laughs> Just walk in and be like, hello, I'm uh, whatever you guys call me. <laughs> <laughs> and then ended up, I uh, fired the OIC on that deployment. You Really? I had to. Yeah, he, was he, that jacked he up? sucked. He, uh, right after an ambush, I was like, I actually pulled off a movie line. I was like, you, sir, are relieved. <laughs> 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 and ended up, you know, Going back and basically, I did a lot of administrative stuff in 2010, but was still right back in it with the guys. You were able to be like the ground force commander and do that. I kind never, of stuff? I never had the needed to do that because I was rolling around at all times with my 300 win mag and two javelin missiles and nice. a clue. Nice. So I think I shot. I think it was either 11 or 13 javelins on that deployment. Nice. Yeah. And then hundreds of 300 wind mag rounds, and I would just get to pick my Overwatch position. Because nobody's going to say nothing. No, I mean, it's like, it was insane. I'm like, you're like Ghost of Salter. Yeah, you I'm just like, do what you want. I'm like, okay, hold on a second here. I'm <laughs> an officer running around heavily armed, getting to pick wherever. It was That's the, insane. <laughs> it was the how best. Did the, did the guys, how do they treat you? I had put most of them through buds. Oh, damn. So it was awesome. Like I said, you know, the Buds Tour, getting to actually form and mold the community and then seeing these guys. I remember when we first went over there, you know, in 2010, you know, it had shifted. People were worried about getting in trouble. There was the long hand of the law that seemed to be hanging out yeah, over the top that. of your head. But as in, you know, 02, 03, in both theaters, I mean, if a guy had walked outside with a pistol, you probably could have AC 130'd the entire village. Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Which also is not correct. Yeah, you know, but I've been in free fire zones. It's like, yeah. wait, everybody is free yeah, fire? Like, I've read about this. Are we sure that we're yeah. playing Call of Duty right now? <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, and we did it. That's yeah. crazy. And, uh, you know, 2010, right before we got there, they bombed a school bus, which was full of a wedding party. Oof. So that's a bad look. And so it was a knee-jerk reaction. And, you know, they shut down night raids. Uh, partner forces were held to uh, much tighter. And guys were worried about getting in trouble. So I saw these new guys who went from, I would describe them as being a little bit hesitant, to the end of the deployment, their teeth are super sharp, and they're making decisions on their own. It was fucking awesome. That's because awesome, they would man. come to me and they would ask questions. You know, uh, I remember the, one of the first times, uh, you know, we, sh we shot and killed this guy, and I was the senior guy in the element, and I had the only radio that was going to reach up, back up to hire to report the BDA. And then, but I just went back and took a nap. Because it was the middle of the day, and they're like, you're not going to call it in? I'm like, I'm going to call it in when I'm ready to call it in. Like, we handled the situation. We don't need to go ask for permission for anything. There's nothing crazy. Yeah, this is war. I'm like, yeah, yeah. like, I'm going to get to it in a little bit. And I can see the light switch click on. They're like, oh, so we have room to make decisions. We have somebody who's uh -huh. not in a rush to report. Like, yeah. I'm like, I got, I've got your guys back. Like, the, the shoot was completely legit. 
and they thought that I was just going to immediately run it up the chain. But I, you know, I'm like, I'm not, I don't need to spin anybody up. I'm not going to call the yeah. troops in contact. Yep. I'm not going to do any of that. I'll report the BDA accurately with the accurate time yep. when it's time to do so. Now I'm going back to sleep. Don't bother me for the next 30 minutes. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome, man. That's and cool it, that you got to experience that too. It was, and then I had I literally made a Buzz Your Light uh, backpack out of a like a Vietnam ruck frame. I would go two two jabbies, mm-hmm. put the three hundred win mag across on top, and then stack the clue on top of that, nice. and just walk around in the desert. That's so awesome, man! <laughs> I had a buddy who was a javelin ace early on in the Iraq War. I got my javelin ace uh, in that so as cool. well. It was, you know, the enemy again. You want to. It's easy. Maybe it's part of the dehumanization, or I agree with what you're saying. It's usually from the lack of experience and exposure, mm-hmm. an attempt to dehumanize, or oh, they're just stupid. Well, guess what? These guys were not coming in five five six range. Yeah, and they were also staying at the far end of seven six two range. You know, because they could take their PK and put it at a nice angle and just start plunging Lob in this and full auto three hundred wind mag. Yeah, and uh, yeah, but a javelin will make it out there. <laughs> I always wanted to fight, fire a javelin in combat. Uh, yeah, like I said, I think I got, it was somewhere between like 11 to 13 of them and it, it was awesome. And I would, I would be like, this is a top attack moment. This is a wow. drill because <laughs> they'd hide behind the rocks and I'd just lob it in. And then Dude. you would just see like torsos. When they go up and then they oh. scream down. I like the uh. up more because it gave me more time to grab my binos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so awesome, man. But you'd see these guys, you know, we'd have multiple high grounds and they would focus all of their attention and they were playing hide and seek, but they weren't doing it very well. Yeah. Because they were obscured from the people that they were looking at and they were just totally broadside to me. I'm like, what? They didn't realize this is coming down. <laughs> and they'd try to hide and they'd always do the same thing. Right about a second to half a second before it hit, you could tell it was coming because they'd go... <laughs> and they'd whip their head and then you just see like torsos and like legs flying off oh, into space such an effective fighting system oh well and it and it messed them up because they didn't know you know for a year if not more they knew the limits of the handheld weaponry yeah and the next thing you know i was shooting that thing well beyond 2k yeah like well beyond the public thinking it's a, a platform above probably yeah. well beyond the published distance even inside of the the javelin mantle and you you actually might appreciate this so we get out to Navajar and I'm looking around and I see all the, the missiles. I'm like, oh, fuck yeah. And I had gone to the Javelin School when I was on the East Coast, but I didn't have a clue. Oh, shit. So I started hitting up ODAs. I'm like, do you guys have a clue? And I found an ODA. He's like, yeah, we got one. I'm like, what do you want for it? He's like, do you guys have those uh, half shell helmets? I was like, yeah. He's like, I'll give it, I'll trade it to you straight up. So I traded a half shell helmet for a clue. Special operations <laughs> bartering 101. That's He's, so awesome. I literally met him. He's like, where's the helmet? I'm like, it's right here in my bag. I'm like, where's the clue? He's like, it's in that bag over there. I'm like, all right, let's do this. <laughs> His team starts like, where'd you get that helmet? He's like, oh, don't, don't worry about I it. I found it. Yeah, it was okay. awesome. So that's how I sourced it was through an ODA. And then just, I remember the first time I shot one, the, the CG down in uh, Kandahar was like, what did you engage? Because the first one I shot at was at a dude on an ICOM radio reporting on our positions. It was just outside of all of our range. And I'm looking around. I was like, well, I'm outside of that range. Yeah. Just fired that thing off. And the, the response on the radio was like, it engaged with what? <laughs> <laughs> one guy, a jab, what? Yeah, I was like, yeah. It was a $100,000 guy. It's fine. And then, uh, yeah, and then they started sending me javelins from Kandahar. That's so I was epic, just man. Them in theater. Oh, <laughs> that's so epic, man. I love that weapon system. It's amazing. I Ch- wish it had a better, you know, the th- when you're actually looking through the missile. I mean, you shot them before. Yeah, yeah. Super degraded. I wish there was a better screen. Screen, because yeah. especially in, you know, I couldn't use it in the midday just because of the overlay of, you know, because it's thermal, right? Yeah. If you turn it on, you're like, well, I can see nothing. Yeah. You know, I had to wait until there was a lot of uh, thermal differentiation between, because I was locking it onto fucking people. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. That's crazy, man. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I love hearing all that, that kind of stuff, because taking advantage of your weapon systems. Well, that, and it showed, you know, the fact that I was willing to do that, I would hope showed the guys that there's a time and place for sharp teeth, right? And there's a mm-hmm. time and place to engage, and there's a time and place and not to engage, and by the end, I mean, I was just super happy to see them appropriately aggressive, making the correct decisions. Mm. And I could sit back and it was just like, yeah, you guys got this. It's awesome. You what's, know? what's your whole opinion on that? Uh, what's that guy? Eddie Gallagher? Did you, did you I had him on podcast? the podcast. How, um, how does that, like, were you, 
off the initial, was there a difference between your initial thoughts when you heard about it? or I have seen the military treat people incredibly fairly. Mm-hmm. And I have seen the military screw people over. Mm-hmm. And I've seen grudges play themselves out inside of uh, units. And I'd you know, be interested to hear your experience. But I never worked with a group of guys where I got along with every single one. Yeah. There was always a personal or professional difference. And it might have been, a, I've seen you know, some damn near fisticuffs over religious beliefs. Mm-hmm. You know, or just a, a, some belief that came to the head. But I've also seen elements that are able to put all differences aside and function seamlessly. And I've seen it where it destroys elements. So I I still net out where I do before I talked with them. Like I can see both of, you know, I can I know of situations where what he was accused of happened. And I know of situations where people said things that didn't happen trying to ruin other people's career. Yeah. It, yeah. The whole thing is a complete mess. He was found, you know, largely innocent other than the the crime of taking a picture with... Posing, yeah. Posing with a picture. And I, I have to accept the verdict, and I want to accept the verdict of the court. Just like if he was found guilty, we would have to accept that verdict too. You can't pick and choose. Yeah. If you're going to have faith in the system, you have to have faith in the verdict, whether it agrees with what you believe or not. So I accept the verdict for what it is. Yeah. You know, and I think that that's all you can do. And I wasn't there and I never tried a Monday morning quarterback people. I think that's important too, because a lot of people, because they're getting the perspective via the media substructure, you know, how, how do you package it is yeah. how you're going to re- uh, take it. Well, what you take in informs what comes out in the, yeah. in, in the form of your opinion and your actions and the shit that comes out of your mouth. Yeah, absolutely. I, I that's what I always told, pe- told people when they asked me for my opinion on him. Like, I don't have opinion, man. I was in the platoon. I don't know the guy. I don't have inside uh, nope. information. Um, I'm going to let it play out in court, and then I'm going to agree with that. And it, it played the way. I mean, I do feel bad for his family, and oh man, because I can't like I imagine, you know, when when you professionally kill people for a living, like there's no. There should be no disillusion of what that reality is. Like special operations are designed to kill people. That's what, and they do it very well. They're uh, very efficiently and effectively. And when you're riding like this line, right, that everywhere else in the world and sovereign society is the steps across the line that get you put in prison forever, um, which I is one of the reasons I like Trump's approach to this, where he gives service members the benefit of the doubt. I think that's important because even if mistakes were made, you have to understand under stress, the highest stress potentially in the world, um, the most complex sometimes circumstances where emotions sometimes get the best of people and you're willing to throw them in prison the rest of their lives and throw away the key, which a lot of guys are in prison because of that, because they made a bad decision in war. I think it has to be admitted up front and acknowledged that if you're going to go to war, mistakes are going to be made. Inherently. Well, it, it, yeah. the decision points are coming back down to human beings, which are flawed. Yes. And I don't know about you, but a lot of the decisions that you have to make, which aren't difficult, you are doing it with incomplete information. Yes. And it's under a very compressed timeline. And yes, people who should have the ability to live a long and fruitful life will not get that opportunity sometimes. Yeah. I think, yeah, that when, when we call it war, that is just a characteristic of it. As leaders, I think we should try our best. And sometimes that's all you can give, right? Your best efforts in maintaining some integrity in that. Um, I've seen the fringes of both sides of it. But at the end of the day, even after a bad trip, I mean... If you've ever done vehicle interdictions, and this is, I'm just making this overt statement, uh, you're identifying a vehicle that potentially a bad guy is in because some form of electronic means of identification, and you don't have a lot of situational awareness of what is exactly in that car. So you've targeted the car like you would target a building. And if one person sees an unsafe act or threat, they're going to call a pro word. They're going to give the signal, and that might that signal might be the initiation of their gun and suppression or effective fire, and then everybody else fires. 
because they get buy-in because they want to believe that that person did it. And then you get on the objective and you do the BDA and you realize, hey, there's kids in this vehicle. The kids being in the vehicle is tragic, but the circumstance in which the person, which typically is a high-value target or, or bad terrorist, um, being around those people, I don't say to myself as a leader or even as a troop, like, that guy um, I should have killed. It is my fault those kids were killed. No. And this is hypothetically. What you should be looking at as a leader is under, giving the understanding that that circumstance, the reason those kids were in that vehicle, is because this dude kills Americans and he happened to take his kids because it's an, it, he knows that he's a target and the way to mitigate his risk is by taking his kids with him. Just like he would hide behind them or just like he would you know, embed himself in his own uh, house inside of his room with him. Um, same with Osama bin Laden, who chose that route. And so I, I think, man, it's Baghdadi did the same exact thing. Yeah, I've seen so many people destroy themselves as as people from our experiences and our backgrounds, uh, our community, because they live with that. And and I've had that tough circumstance. I've I've had shoots where I'm like, you know, should I have in, uh, in acted on that? And at the time I took the most amount of information and the best amount of information in a rapid period of time and made a call. And even if that call was wrong, then I'm okay with living with that. Yeah. Because if I don't make that call and I become indecisive, then I'm more of a threat to myself and the security of my guys. And that ties into, I mean, let's be honest, there's a burden and a weight to making the decisions and operating in the environments with which we did. And I think that should be expected, and I think it should be talked about, and that's where I think it ties into the communities would be better off if mental health and hygiene processes, and it was, you know, it brought to the forefront. It yeah. gave guys the tools. Yeah. First person I ever shot, I would say, was maybe 13 to 14 years old. I've had those, yeah. And uh, he was running up a set of stairs to protect his dad because his dad was in a physical altercation with another friend of mine on the roof. I turned around and saw a figure running up a roof with an AK-47. Mm -hmm. And... That was it, you know, and I have kids that bracket his age and I see, yeah. and I see that kid in my, in my sons. I would think about him, mm -hmm. not in a perspective where, believe me, I'm not overwhelmed with, uh, with guilt by it. And I would make the same decision 101 out of a hundred times again, because it was the only decision that I could have made in that situation. But I certainly will remember that kid for the rest of my life. And, uh, you know, I remember, I remember he, the peach fuzz mustache that he had and, uh, the other day I was looking at my 14 year old and I was like, fucking peach, peach fuzz mustache. You know, Damn. it took me right back to that moment. And yeah. that's the cost. And I would rather, I would rather carry that weight and cost than ever have my children have to be on that wall to make the same decision. <laughs> that's such a great perspective because that's the, that's the overall arching point, which is if you're not there, somebody else is. And when you commit to a fighting force, that's going to have to do, um, bad things to bad people and be involved in these decisions, why not be you? You know, I, I, me and Kevin, I, I hired one of my special operations buddies, Kevin Owens, and I got a great group of guys, all the guys, George, Raul, they all have ex, ex, extensive experiences in special operations. But me and Kevin were on a rooftop one time in Sauter City, and this dude, uh, I think Kevin had killed one of the guys IMTing. He was he was individually moving tactically against us. He was trying to advance on us, and he he shot him with a long gun. Um, it was too shot far of a shot for my carbine, but as soon as that guy dropped, a kid ran. And this dude was probably the same age, thirteen. Yep. Swooped up his gun and started running down the the road that was where we were holding containment and we had a blocking position. And the striker, uh, we were using strikers at the time, opened fire with a 50 cal, but with the RWS, the remote weapon system, um, at that distance, it's like the holdover, right? It's so close. He didn't compensate for that because it zeroed out. That probably it was, zipped right over the top of his head. It did. And so immediately we knew we had to take the shot. Kev shot him. It was a run, The dude was running. The kid was running. And then he tumbled and he sat up. And I immediately knew he was suffering. And I, and I remember, maybe it was an afterthought because I didn't even think. Like he sat up and I, 
I shot him in the face. And I, but I, I remember thinking when I saw him run, I was like, that dude's a kid. And I saw him under night vision, but I knew he, he was going to be gunned down because he, 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 had, he had an opportunity at, the, at which the point, the 50 cal shot of turning around. That was essentially our warning shots. And so we gave him the opportunity, and we didn't know if he had a vest. He was going to run into yeah. our guys on the blocking position. So we shot him, and I felt like I put him down, which is maybe me making sense of it to say I was trying to end his suffering. But it was, it was, it was uh, definitively offensive. Like, I saw it, I reacted, and I did what I had to do. And I also think about that. I, I almost get like a blur because I didn't get to see his face because it was in green and black. Yeah for my night vision, but all those little micro experiences of doing hundreds of combat operations, right? I mean, there's some units, regular army units that go to war for a year and they don't do any combat operations. They're pulling security on a gate, which it sucks for them, but that's some people's experiences. But you accumulate so many passive memories that are just stored in your head that create this plaque um, this cavity in the back of your head that if you don't have that outlet, like hunting, like hiking, like overlanding, like even running a company, right, and keeping our brains yep. focused, you almost relapse into subconsciousness that just happens to be that cavitational wound that remains in your head. And then that's when things get bad because you start picking those memories apart, thinking that you can somehow articulate or justify or relive that moment and change things for the different and i never want to do that but i could see how that rips people apart well and you're also doing it absent the context of the moment mm -hmm. you know you're doing this thirty thousand foot view and you're you're zooming into a pin drop moment that requires all of the other context that same night that i was telling you about i had to i made the basically the same decision as he was going up the stairs um it's so if I remember we were rolling, uh, I think pack two still. Mm -hmm. So I had my laser on first shot. It goes off. It like the round shook the pack two. I'm like, God damn it. Oh. So I'm turning it back on, <laughs> but it stopped him and he rolled backwards down to the base of the stairs. And I could see that he was suffering because he ended up being almost in a seated position facing 180 degrees from where he was running. And he was kind of rocking back and forth. And I could see that he was suffering too. And I could tell at that point what, that it, the relative age of the individual. And at the same time, his mother left the structure. Cause we were actually, I was holding a rooftop position on a structure that was where I ended up shooting was the six o'clock of where my original uh, roles and responsibilities were. Cause I just happened to turn around as one. It was the compound behind the one we were supposed to be in. Took the shots. He fall down. His mother came out yelling and I could see the kid rocking and I knew he was suffering, and I just shot him four more times yeah. until he stopped moving. Yeah. Because I, don't, I, at the same time... And that probably happened in milliseconds. Oh, it right? absolutely yeah. did. Yeah. It absolutely did. And, you know, he eventually slumped over, and then, you know, I listened to his mother wailing for the next 30 minutes as we were waiting for the target secure. But, you know, if you take all that context out of that and you just look at it from that perspective, that's going to scramble your fucking eggs. That's a great point because that's... I, you're absolutely right. When you, a lot of people... A lot of people haven't even vocally or out loud described that circumstance. So they suppress it in their head, and then they manipulate the data. And, you, you know, it's obvious that we are very bad at memory and manipulating data in the first place. And so they paint this picture that's inherently flawed. It's most definitely flawed. But when they don't vocalize it and then come to terms or even find uh, maybe the empathy in it or find the... When, when you talk about things, it relieves the internal struggle because you don't have to contemplate anymore because you've said it out loud, which I think is important in any kind of therapy, right? Counseling is what that is. Yeah, it's, it's just, the release. It's the release of getting out of your head open. And I, what I think is important is, number one, your listeners to hear it, right? I think it's important that we have these kind of conversations. But two, the communities that we came from doing the same and making people understand because it, what I what I'm always what I'm always wondering is most people think post traumatic stress relates to an incident, and then I think about our experiences, whether that's JSOC or USASOC or special operations as a whole. When we were hitting targets every single night for periods of time, 
it was so fluid, so fast. You just went on target. You did the, the hit. You might have killed bad guys. You might have even lost a guy. But then the next night you're going out. And so you don't have if time. If not again that night. Yeah, if, if not again flex into another target and doing it that night. And it became so rampant in the accumulation of these memories that some people don't understand that our backgrounds are the highest risk. Our communities are the highest risk because of the accumulation factor. And, you know, post-traumatic stress for me in the context doesn't necessarily mean specific moments, even with that kid. It's the accumulation yeah. of those moments. And maybe even not me coming to terms with never being able to do that again, to be able to experience that feeling of feeling alive again. Because when you, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not about, it's not specifically about being engaged in combat, but just being in the culture and the environment, that experience, I try to replicate in everything I do. When I live out of my truck, even at my own home, I'm always trying to find small elements I can instill that remind me of the best times of my life. People have asked me before, and I don't know if anybody's ever asked you this, they'll say, did you enjoy killing? And the first time I was asked that question, I didn't, I didn't actually feel like answering it. I was like, it was just a job, dude. I didn't really think that much about it. Because I was, it's like, I forget the first setting that it was asked. It was like at a dinner, a mixed party. I was like, hey, fuck bag. Maybe we could <laughs> have you some. not say that out loud? <laughs> yeah. Can we maybe have some situational awareness and not have this conversation to mixed company? Um, you're completely socially inappropriate. And I'm going to make you suffer years down the road for this. <laughs> uh, but it got me thinking about it, actually. And uh, I was talking with somebody not too long ago. And the realization that I came to is that it's, I, didn't, I didn't like killing. I loved it. Because it is the ultimate competition between two people that have equal beliefs to the point where they're willing to fight for it. And it was not the act of killing that I necessarily enjoyed. It was the act of testing myself against somebody who had an equal level of belief. And I can think of no better competition than that one where the consequences are so dire. Yeah, I agree. And I've said that out loud and offended many people throughout my well, it, it took me a while to uh, to come to that realization because it's you know it's there's this um, you know the way people talk about killing it should always be viewed at, it like has this negative connotation mm -hmm. to it and it's not something that you should enjoy or if you do enjoy it it's like oh well you're a little bit twisted and the reality is I didn't like it I truly absolutely did love it mm -hmm. but the act of taking another life that was the that was the end state of the competition. What I really loved was the testing of myself in that environment. Yeah. In an environment that people would tell you, you should never go there. You should never do this. You should never explore this portion of who you are. Mm -hmm. And I have found that I think that those years were probably some of the most formative years of my life. And they inform who I am now and the decisions that I make now and the, the lens that I view the world through now. Yeah. Yeah, those, those accumulation of memories and, and engaging bad guys, for me are so vivid, right? It's such a, it's like, you know, if you're behind your bow and you're going to take, let's say it's big game, let's say it's an elk, you've been observing them for a period of time. And part of that process and, and whether... Well, let me be clear. I'll shoot at an elk through a bush that I've only seen for a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're an opportunist. <laughs> yeah. Time-sensitive targets, I too. will shoot at an elk that surprises <laughs> me, just for clarity. I would prefer to watch them for hours because they're a majestic beach beast, but if that son of a bitch is like, ha, ah, I'm going to like pull... <laughs> That's so funny. That's a TSD version of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, what's crazy is like, there's a whole cycle, right? And what I loved about it was the lead up through the cycle where you get bits of information and you're tracking a name right on the deck and then maybe you're tracking a photo and then you're tracking if you're the, lucky if you're lucky <laughs> if you're lucky right probably got a number instead so yeah you have the question the black face with the it's like uh, the outline of a fa face i don't want to say black face i'm going to get offended yeah it's uh, the However, outline however the of a pictures black face. were black probably because it was a black and white printer people it had a white uh, uh, question mark though yeah. so that's it and a sim card number and it's like go get this guy yeah <laughs> he's the guy i'm like oh man this is tough but i remember yeah, being in those moments where maybe you're on containment and you get in an engagement. And I've had incidents where I've watched people several times. I, I killed a few dudes 
on a rooftop where I was watching them before I killed them because I was waiting for them to do something that would, for me, justify me taking their lives. And it was pre-assault, so we hadn't done the breach yet. And then when the breach was initiated, then they perked up, and I knew it. And I was a, a, a sniper at the time, and I was on a containment position. But those those moments I remember very vividly because it's like the alternative in that story in any of those stories of those incidents is you are going to compromise your life for the life of your men. And so when you infill, like you said, you know, that makes sense to me now, the, the one minute out, you just get honed because you're ready to commit sometimes in anger, sometimes in fo- or focus and the combination of those two things this energy in you that has been training technically for so long and you're at the game. You're searching and hunting at that point. That's it. You, you, you are, you are, when you're infilled, you're at the game. And what's insane is so many people who don't understand how special operations, and I think I heard you talk about it, they don't understand how boring the job actually is. But when it's not boring, boring is that one minute call out. I mean, I'll be sleeping in an M860 oh, sure. and they're tapping everybody up. Hey, one minute out. And then it's like all of a sudden you turn on. And when you hit that ground, you're fighting literally for your life. And you, you're, you know, we're sight hunters. We're just focused. And then when you come off that objective and maybe you got a couple guys shot, a couple guys injured, it feels good knowing that those guys are in the dirt and you're taking off, going back to eat hot chow with your guys. Um, that whole cycle for me is is it, it was addictive, yep. and and it I, c- I do talks miss back it. to the seductive nature of the occupation. Yeah, I miss that part. And I, I what I do is I feel sorry for the new guys who didn't get to experience Syria because Syria, from all my buddies who have talked uh, talked to me about it, depending on what unit you're with, was great, mm-hmm. especially for long range warfare. Um. But we got that prime, and I don't think it's like the which was by luck, by if luck, by timing, completely by the the year on the calendar in which we were born. That's it. And I think about those Mac V saw guys who integrate back in society, thinking that because of the perspective of everybody who watched the war on, you know, on TV, thinks it was just a shit show and nothing was done, and those dudes were doing work. And then they got back and then they try to tell their stories through books. They didn't have the media platforms we had, but I'm glad that uh, we're at least talking about it because that, that story or those stories of that time period um, and, and it's, it is toll on psychology and, and people yeah. should be talked about. Yeah. You know, my dad is a Vietnam veteran and he was, you know, in the SEAL community, we were working on Mark fives for, you know, insert and extract. He was on a Mark one. Wow. Twin 50 cal gunner up front in the boat. That's awesome. Foot pedals for, you know, windage and a little bit of up down for elevation. And He's probably, a boat guy, a swick guy. What do they call him? He wasn't guy? even. A, he yeah. just, you know, he. Uh, I think they were just standing up the swick program at that point. I mean, he was essentially filling that role. But the yeah. first squadron of the jacuzzi powered engines going into Vietnam, which guess what, didn't function that well. Wow. He said one time, he's like, yeah. Basically, every time we get into a firefight, they would clog with leaves. It was pretty great. Ah, oh, man. But you know, double butterfly trigger up there, just. Getting it. Getting it with two modus. That that was, people don't realize the Vietnam War with over 60,000 American casualties and the war that special operations fought, that was warfare. I mean. And they like you said, they didn't have, I don't think my dad ever had the opportunity or maybe he didn't have the willingness or desire to, or maybe even more than that, people didn't want to hear what they had to say. And I think the the fact that you and I can sit down and talk about this, like this is extremely beneficial and probably healthy for both of us. Mm-hmm. Because like you said, it, there, and the difference is for whatever reason, people now want to hear about this, mm-hmm. which surprises me to a degree because a lot of them like, that's just the job. I mean, yeah, you know, it was wildly amazing. And also I slept a lot, you know, it's like yeah. it was boring and exciting, but at least we have... There is a desire for people to hear others talk about it. So it elicits that from the people who experienced it, which I think in some way is that cathartic release. And from all of my, I mean, obviously I wasn't around post Vietnam, but it sounds like the opposite experience. That's exactly why 
the mental health crisis is what it is in that community, that demographic. I mean, most of those 22 veterans a day that are killing themselves happen to be Vietnam. Older generations, yeah, yeah. Vietnam veterans. I actually, I don't like that number 22. If you look at that. I don't either. If you I, look at the I stats. I have a problem of, with it. Yeah, how yeah. they, how they, it was like 24 states out of 50, very yeah. inaccurate data. Yeah. And they also didn't break out the age range because I was surprised to find out when I dug into it myself, the vast majority are from the Vietnam era, if not older. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's, if that's the case, maybe we ought to be taking a look at that, you know, instead of just, oh, 22 a day. Well, let's look at that 22 and see what that I actually think it's a lot is. more. I, would I do think, I think it's more, more too. Yeah. So where'd your career take you? I think we are at 03, 04 at this point. Oh yeah. So you're on your second enlistment. I'm just yeah. curious the path that you took in the military and then you did some interesting shit afterwards as well. Yeah. I went to, so I went to the commanders in extremist force. I was an assaulter, a breacher. Um, I did it. Uh, I deployed it. Uh, to Iraq, 06, 07, 08. Uh, I did go to the unit for a period of time, uh, went there to be an operator, got my PP spanked. Mm. I actually went to a selection class, uh, historically known for one of the highest attrition rates. Yep. There was four of us that made it out of 150. Um, in fact, a lot of my buddies that I know were in that class, unbeknownst to me. Um, but great experience, got to the unit, got in trouble, um, just some dumb shit. What'd, it was, you, what'd you do? It was all me, man. I mean, <laughs> I actually, I was getting counsel for dumb shit. Um, I, I got, I got counsel for disrespect and I wasn't known as being a disrespectful guy. It's just not something I do. And I remember I signed that counseling statement and I looked at my mentor, Chris, and I'm like, are you really going to make me sign this man? He's like, I'm sorry, man. I, I don't see you doing that. You just got to do what you got to do. And I was like, am I being blackballed here, man? It's like, what's going on? Like, what do I need to do? And I pushed on and got in trouble, got put on probation, um, did a job that that I didn't want to do, but turned out to be one of the greatest experiences I've ever had, working in a low-vis co- uh, capacity. Um, did some crazy shit that I never thought I'd do. In fact, I, I, looking back on it, uh, without regret, that experience opened the door to me to a lot of stuff that I didn't realize existed that normal guys in that unit wouldn't have been able to experience. Interesting how that works out, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It absolutely is. I could have went back and been a, you know, six IC on a team carrying a ladder. No offense to six ICs uh, carrying ladders. But I made E8 right after my probation and I had an option. And the option was to cycle through a couple things and uh, go across the hall uh, after being across the hall. Or I was offered a position to stand up a new unit um, with JSOC's help. I was, act- I was actually asked by JSOC to do this. So I took that as an opportunity, man. I, I had I stood up a SIF company as a sniper reconnaissance team sergeant. I was the first guys to deploy. I was the first team to deploy from that unit to Libya right after Benghazi, um, October of, uh, of 2012. Um, and then we started targeting Abu Ghattala, the shithead that we eventually rolled up, um, which was a great op, by the way. I can't talk about that one, but that was great from a lot of the JSOC community. Mm-hmm. Um, then I got to a position where I actually got recruited overseas by the agency. Um, I wanted to be a ground branch officer since day one. That's after Mike Spann was killed, who was one of the first paramilitary operations officers killed. He was the first casualty in the GWAT. Uh, he was killed in a Northern Alliance, uh, prison Mm -hmm. where they were rolling up Taliban and putting them in prison. That where they found Johnny Walker as well. Yes. Yeah. They had a revolt there. Uh, you know Walker? Not personally. I know of yeah, him. Yeah. I worked with him a lot. Um, the interpreter, right? No, didn't they find the American? Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's where he was found. Yeah. In that camp. I also... Long-bearded, yeah, dirty, nasty... Yeah. Was his nasty. name Johnny Walker? Johnny Walker Lynn, something like that? John, yeah. John Lynn. Lynn, I think it was his name. Johnny Walker was you guys' Interpreter. Interpreter. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that fuckbag is due for uh, parole soon. Shut up. For what? It is time. Oh my God! Really? He's going to get out? I have no idea. That's insane. 
He wasn't he like the first prisoner captured in the war in war. He was a Taliban fighter. Mm-hmm. He was beat. He got recruited. He got assessed. He traveled to get his jihad on. I read an article about him not too long ago. I don't even remember how I stumbled on it, but I believe I want to podcast that dude. <laughs> I want to do some other things to that dude. Yeah. <laughs> well, we should podcast him and uh, invite him over. That's from insane. My, from my understanding, his beliefs have not changed. Ooh, that's scary. Yeah, so I don't know if he would want to podcast with you. Ooh, but it would be interesting for sure. Yeah, that'd be fucking interesting. Yeah, I mean to have a. I would be willing to do it too, to have a conceptual discussion and disagreement. I would be willing to do that. Yeah. Yeah. A war of ideas. Just yeah. and leave it at that. Unless we you probably need each other to... on a battlefield somewhere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you might just want to do that Skype or virtual. I think it would be okay because the reality is you could squash that dude like an ant. Oh, so quickly. That's what I'm saying. So it, it might no... help him because yeah. he doesn't know his, his reality is, is one, he lives in a, he's an ideologue and he lives in a fake alternate reality so everything he thinks is real he's probably never been punched in the face except for when he got rolled up yeah oh what a shit bag yeah so i know mike's man that incident yeah i remember yeah. that very well that got a lot of press actually it did and and i remember reading about mike and his background as being a marine corps officer and his path and i wanted to be in on the battlefield before special operations in that capacity in some way and you know our community works a lot with ground branch Mm -hmm. and you know and this is nothing you can google this shit but i knew immediately i was getting the fuck out i had my college degree which by by far is the most difficult and most biggest pain in the ass for me to accomplish because i was nickel and diming it in war but when I got that, the whole reason I got that, because I knew it was a prerequisite, I needed a college degree. Yeah, it was the leverage for something else. That's it. Checking the block. And so I got back from that rotation, and I immediately got out. And for a master sergeant in the Army, with my experience or my background, to drop his papers, the whole chain of command was like, what the fuck is going on? So I had a lot of explaining to do, but when I told them about the agency, they got it. Yeah. They were on board, and they supported it. So I got over... Um, and started finishing off the process, but I transitioned and got over to the reserve component of SF, which is, in this case, 19th Special Forces Group. I took a team there, quickly made Sergeant Major, but I was sitting on my ass because that's one weekend a month. Don't forget well, the two weeks a year. Yeah, two fucking <laughs> weeks a year, man, which is just a big scam. I mean, the, the Guard is like the, the biggest scam in a good way for guys especially that that federally dip in police fire or whatever it is because they can nickel and dime both and they can go deployments and go yeah. to sniper school and they actually have, it seems like they have much more control over their schedule than an a active shit duty guy yeah a shit ton so they can go to war and they go back to fort living room and just fucking hang out with the wife or hang out with the kids fort living room is bitching though it is it's, <laughs> it's my favorite now that's where i'm <laughs> retired to um so I got out, and then at the same time that I out-processed, the sequester happened. So they stopped. They freezed all hiring. Well, I put up with this shit for six months, was depressed, was going on my fucking mind, you know, going from a team sergeant, going to war, and every year to nothing um, was difficult for me. Finally, I called him. I said, listen, I, don't, I can't do this much longer. What are my options? And so they said, we can make you a contractor. Like, Perfect. And so when I went to do the contracting, they didn't make me a GB contractor, which I was like, what the fuck? I, they made me GRS. And no offense to GRS for, for saying like that. I'm, I just wanted to be GB. So I went to GRS, went down range, started deploying, and you know was, an, was a contractor, and started seeing behind the curtain. We, we often, people often think the grass is always greener. Yeah, I, I, by often, I think all the time. All the time, yeah. <laughs> I we think always the term think that. you're searching for is all the time. We're always chasing the rainbow. I'm guilty of it too. I've done yeah. it before as well. Well, my career path is I'm always chasing the rainbow. I'm trying to get the kill. I'm trying to get to the unit where you, you don't have a lot of oversight. The con op process isn't long. You got all the tools. You got the training. Unlimited budget. (laughs) Unlimited budget. (laughs) The perfect movie. It's like a Jack Carr uh, book. It's the perfect storm, and it doesn't exist. (laughs) And that is the reality. I hate to tell people this. 
you worked directly for the agency. <laughs> Did you ever see anybody that looked or worked like Jason Board? No. I know there's he doesn't a, exist. There's so many that thought they were. There's Jason Bumblehead. <laughs> but Jason, I mean, I wanted to exist too. Like, I'm sorry, James Bond is not oh, out there, guys. It, it, it doesn't exist in the worst way. And that's when I realized it because all the exposure, especially being in that job, um, intimately involved in operations and everything that uh, is behind the curtain. And... I realized in in a country that I was operating in at the time that the guys on the other side, the GB side, were not happy as well. And, you know, things have changed. ISIS in Syria and in Iraq and the, the surge of that did give opportunities for for dudes to do, do cool stuff. Yeah. But eventually it dried up, and at the time that I was in, it dried up, and I did a, a couple years, did six or seven rotations, making good money, but realized I didn't want to do that my whole fucking life, which I was prepared to. If I became a GB staff officer, which is what I really wanted to do, um, and I have good friends that are there now, I would have committed my life to operations, which many in our background do. Yeah, I mean, They don't have the luxury of sitting on a deck overlooking a beautiful lake in Montana, um, doing podcasts, etc., they do, but they've chosen a different path. 100%. So, and, yes. and I respect the path and choices that they made. Me yeah. landing here and us sitting down in this conversation, so much accidental shit has happened for us to be here. Yes. You know, I never, again, without a college degree, the agency contracting stuff, the stuff that you're talking about, largely unavailable to me. And I think I would have had the same realization and been like, God damn it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and you know, I didn't want to get out. I got medically retired. My, I got to the point where I couldn't do the job and I was so pissed and bummed and didn't know what I was going to do. And it's the best thing that could have happened for me because I met people and was influenced by people outside of the military and started doing things that I never thought I would do. Like what we're doing right now. I would have mm -hmm. never thought in a million years that, Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit the record button. Mm. And just talk into a microphone and hope that people listen to it. Like, what, Why do you think, I was, I'm always curious of this, especially from your community, because you'd think that people with our backgrounds who, who are intelligent could come out, transition, and then have a successful something. And, yeah. I, you know, it's all dependent on the person, obviously. But when you see a guy like you or I see Jocko doing great things, Jack, if that's his real name. It's a name. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jack Pussy Cars is middle name. Nobody knows that. All these guys doing good things. Um, I always wonder why guys, some guys come out. Like, who's the dude who runs soft rep? Uh, Brandon Webb. He's fucking hated. He's a piece of shit. He's hated. And I see him I'm like, you came out before everybody else and you could have been a fucking Jocko, but you chose to be a piece of shit. And I, and it sucks. Yeah. And I, I wonder, like, and and people see through it, and and people hate that uh, place. A lot of people have turned on soft rep, including us. We're just not big fans of it. I don't overtly and deliberately try to hurt them, but I'm just not big fans. Yeah. Why is there just so extreme left and extreme right of that version? You'd think everybody would come out squared away. Well, that would be the case if everybody went in squared away. Mm. You know, there's a bell curve in every community, and no selection process is perfect. I mean. Think about the JSOC units, right? Probably, by definition, the most highly performing, cohesive teams on the face of the planet. Mm. And there were top performers and low performers. There were shitbags. Correct. And I'm like, how is that possible? But now that shitbag is probably going to outperform yeah. most people, He's right? better than everybody else. But in one, comparison yeah. to his peers, he still is a shitbag. And, you know, one of the things I love about the military is it's such a melting pot. I mean, you're going to serve with every belief system, uh, you know, gender, race, fill in the blank. Like, they're all going to be there to some degree. And, you know, the military, I certainly think, can build you. And there's so much that the military has to offer for an individual, which I don't think is talked about enough. You know, people are like, oh, I, I'm joining to serve. And it's, and it's like, yeah, but, dude, you can get a lot out of it, too. There's so many programs and education. And, like, it's really a two-way street in a lot of ways. Yeah. But – if you go in on the lower side of the bell curve, you're still going to come out on the lower side of the bell curve. You know, and I think the biggest thing that the mistake that I would say, I don't know Brandon personally. I'm not a fan. And the reason I'm not a fan, and I think that a lot of people from the community are not, is he is portraying something 
that he is not. I think one of the biggest things that grates against our community is a lack of authenticity in who you actually are. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is the stuff that we did, it's fucking cool enough. And when you start layering on top of that bullshit, the tolerance for that inside of the community is almost non-existent. Um, and I would say in most guys, it's completely non-existent. And people get into issues when they, they start doing something that just they're trying to be something that they're not. They try mm -hmm. to layer bullshit on top of something that was enough. You know, Brandon was the first one through the wall. And what fell apart on him, I think, is that people started seeing through the facade. I mean, if a fact checker, if you take a fact checker and bounce it up against a lot of the things that he says, you know, instead of telling you what the result is going to be for the people listening, go do it yourself. Because yeah. the results are obvious. And that is why he has the reputation that he does. You know, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, people on the high end of the bell curve are going to come out even better. People on the low end of the bell curve, they're going to come out better than they were before. But still, you know, they, I mean, fuck. I worked with some narcissistic, egotistical, self-centered, individual reward motivated people. Mm -hmm. And when they get out, they're still going to be that same person. Yeah, it, that's so true because I see people who get out and I think they want to own the persona because they they think that civilians, because of their experiences and packaged neatly in a trident or a crest or a tab, are entitled to that respect. And with media, the way it's driving so rampant, you can't hide. And so when you're coming out and you're saying, I'm perfect because I'm the baddest motherfucker on the planet, I'm a, a great sniper, I train the best snipers, and you do all this stuff, and you're not authentic. Like me telling the story of my experiences in JSOC, it doesn't feel good to talk about that because it, it was a part of my life where I'm like, fuck, this sucks, and it was horrible. Yeah. But I want to be authentic where I've done enough. I've killed enough bad guys. I've been to war enough. I've done enough for my country and for myself. And that's all that matters. But I don't need to paint a picture like I'm this elite fucking invincible warrior. And I think that that's the problem. Maybe that's the disparity between you you and and some of the guys versus the elitist who just are are holier than thou. I, I try to be so honest. I mean, I'm a complete functioning moron. You know, it's yeah. like I, I truly have felt utterly like if I had a superpower, my superpower is the ability to be average. Yes. Like I exceptionally average at the things that I do. I can't look at any one thing that I've done in my life and go, you know what? I was really, really good at that. And I was surrounded by peers that I was constantly in awe of their abilities not in like one package, like there was no Superman running around, but I'd see a guy on a long gun and be like, God damn it. We went to the same school. How are you doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, or somebody's ability to make tactical decisions or their understanding of clearance and how they could just digest problems. Just mm -hmm. like, God damn, man, how does your mind work? Or shooting standards or performance in the house or like all of these standards. I could meet the standards, but I never was the standard. Yeah. I was exceptionally average throughout my entire career. And I'm just going to be honest about that. Like, I, yeah. I, I spend more time talking about my mistakes, probably because there was more mistakes than, you know, successes. Yeah. I got a shit ton. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, you guys want to hear a story about uh, somebody making a bad decision? How much time do you have? So there was this one time that I had a knife and a bar. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's so. And I think there's, I don't know, I couldn't live with myself if I was trying to layer on that facade, and I think some people can, and but that's just not me. Yeah, and that, that probably has to do with narcissism, right? It has to do with something ingrained in that person, and they're probably fucked up before they got in the military. It really, you yeah. know, and again, the people who pursue the path that we did, like I said, the argument could be made that, you know, we might have a few screws loose, or perhaps our screws are just different than the other the screws that hold other people together. Yeah. Yeah, you always are remembered or reminded of that when you're in the company of nobody who has your background experience. Yeah. And you could easily just go down a rabbit hole and you say one thing. 
Like, oh, yeah, fucking combat. Shoot people in the face. That was fucking awesome. And people were like, what in the fuck? Or you laugh at something that is just so macabre <laughs> to people. It's so inappropriate. And you're just like, bah! <laughs> like, I had, oh, my God. I had this video the other day of an ISIS dude. It's probably obvious in Afghanistan. He's holding his rifle between his legs, and he's, like, trying to get it to work, looking down the barrel. He, like, jams it, and then his hat goes flying off, and he falls over. <laughs> I was dying. Fucking dying. Like 30 minutes, tears in my eyes. People are like, what the fuck, man? I'm like, dude, this is awesome. <laughs> to me. Oh. It was awesome to me. Uh, there's, a, there's one video that I love. It's one of my favorite uh, javelin videos. They, shoot, they launch a javelin, and there's a dude. He's got a tent set up, and it's like a whole bunch of guys, and it's, it's their little LPOP. You know, They got a little observation post, and they don't realize that these guys had done recce on them. But they don't realize that they just got shot at, but they hear something. So all of them are just like looking back. They're like, what the fuck was that? And then you see their behavior kind of change, and they kind of look off, and then they see it. And so <laughs> they're looking at it, then they run into the tent because they think the tent's going to offer them or afford them some protection. And there's no cover in, in a tent. There's a mild concealment. From rain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this thing... And, and, and you could see the back end of it and the gas and everything behind it. And then it immediately pops up and comes down and just blasts the tent. Yeah. Like it's a bag of popcorn that you just smash the top of. Yeah. And just shit just goes everywhere. And, dude, I love that. And every time I show people, because I'm, I'm trying to elicit their response to justify me laughing. Yeah. Like, look at this. This is funny, right? And they're like, uh, people be yeah. like, People be like, did I just watch somebody die? I showed some people that video and they're like, did that man just shoot himself in the face? I'm like, what do you think made his hat come off? <laughs> And they're like, Sick fucks. yeah, and they're like, you're fucked up, man. I'm like, totally, I'm fucked up. Absolutely, I'm not saying I'm not, but God. this is funny. Ha ha to me. We are so fucked up. <laughs> Tell me about Fieldcraft Survival. We haven't even touched on wh where did the idea come from? First off, what is it? And then where did the idea come from? Do you know, did you know who uh, Ryan Owens was? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I won't say his name because he's, he still works, but his brother and me were partners in my contracting job did a lot of good work all over the world. And, um, me and him, I, I don't give him, I don't give him, uh, financial credit. Cause I'm not going to part. Why would you check. do that? Yeah, of course. <laughs> He's in the Navy. I was in the army. Credit where credit is due. It didn't say a check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we actually, I brainstormed an idea. I was in Pakistan. I was fucking bored out of my mind and I was just analyzing my life. I was depressed, man. I, I remember reading the book, the power of now, I think Eckhart, something Eckhart, um, because I was so fucked up in trying to not, to think about my next move and getting anxiety about everything around me and outside of me, but not super focused on, the, on even the mission. And I, was, I, I felt like I was slipping. You know, operationally, it's like we look at ourselves often and go, hey, are we potentially a liability? Are we, we're, we're typically looked in our units as being a value add or liability. And I felt like I was a liability because I, I couldn't get my head right. So I read that book and I thought to myself, man, start doing course of action development, start war gaming alternatives. And people in those contracting job, which we call the thousand air club, because you go from even as a senior E7 or E8 in my position, I was a, a sergeant major at the time. I would make 75 K after with a deployment that cycle yeah i was gonna say probably near near a six-figure threshold probably yeah near it and depending on how long i would spit down range would it would accumulate more cash flow you go from making that in a year to making that almost per rotation in 60 days and so i was taking that money and i was blowing out of my ass i was buying adventure motorcycles and off-road rigs and all kinds of shit and then it's i a just, strong play Super strong, man. I, I thought I did well. I'm not gonna lie to you. I support it. I bought a Rolex watch and a KTM Adventure. That's. I was like, I'm living the dream. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was broke because I just I'm wasted living it. Living my best life currently. <laughs> yeah. I did that, man. It was great. Um, and then I realized, you know, to have some future in this because I was seeing these guys that I was rolling with. They were in their 50s and they were living rotation to rotation or check to check in that case. Yeah. Coming back, blowing it for 60 days, going back overseas, accumulating it, and just a constant ebb and flow. And so I, I started predicting uh, based on <laughs> the, uh, the model, like, hey, this is the job, this is the predictions of success based on these parameters. Uh, I big into data and was data analyzing it and then wargaming it with uh, Ryan's bro. 
And I started with a brewery. I was like, man, I, I, I love beer. I like how it's made. I like the science behind it. I like the culture, uh, the history. And then I modeled it out and realized I just like drinking beer, like <laughs> doing a fucking business. That's an important model for you to work your way through it. Like, okay, hold it on. Is. In this portion of the equation, yes, I prefer being the consumer. <laughs> as I, as I yeah. chug it. Yep. Um, I was like, that's probably not going to work. And uh, it, it actually would have been a good play because early on it was the craft brewing Boom. bubble. It oh, was fuck. The bu- yeah, it blew the fuck up, man. Did it bubble out though? It was It was when, because I had done a whole bunch of business uh, analysis, it was when 5% of the overall market was craft beer. So it was right before the boom. It was when uh, the guy from, uh, what's that brewing company, The one of the famous ones. Anyways, he wrote a business book on it. And mm-hmm. I had read that book thinking about this and it was only 5%, which blew up the fucking, it's like 67. It's huge now. Yeah. But... Glad I didn't go that route. The other route was tactical training instructor. That's a dime a dozen, man. Everybody in our background is going to potentially look at that as an option. Yeah. And in a lot of times, though, the who has the best looking website will win. That's it. It That's the, <laughs> I tell all my buddies who call me and they're like, man, hey, I've been seeing you doing business stuff. I want to start a tactical business. And the first thing I say is, don't do a tactical business. Talk to me when you actually create a real business model. Yeah. Because being a tactician uh, even teaching for yourself under your own brand is a horrible business decision. It's horrible because the model doesn't, I mean, it's like a, it's like a restaurant model, right? In service where there's a whole bunch of s- specific things that you could analyze. Um, the seat, for example, in a restaurant, you could predict how many people are going to be in that seat per day, per week, per year, uh, based on your business hours, opening, optimal seasons, et cetera. It's just like that with a flat range because you have, 25 yards by 25 yards. What's yep. the overhead in that? How many people per play? And when you do the math, it's not a lot of damn money, no matter how you look at it. It's and a lot of time, though. Total, almost waste of an accumulation of time. Because by the time you get to the point where we're at, where we're five years into this, we're just now going, okay, now we're in the green for tactics. Um, wasn't going to do that. And, and I didn't want to exclusively do tactics because – I honestly didn't think I was like the tactical God. I, I've seen, uh, you know, Kyle Lamb, who got out before me, uh, who, who I highly respect, uh, he was that guy. And, you know, even Chris Costa, who a lot of people aren't fans of, I'm not, I'm not a fan either, but he was doing it as opposed to me, who was 10 years behind that. So I looked at survival as a genre. And survival for me, uh, it, I thought about, Imagine me and you are loading out for an operation. We get a TST call that, hey, there's a shithead in this area. The helicopters are spinning up. We don't have a lot of time. We throw on kit, and we go out without a lot of information. We might get it in the bird. Mm -hmm. We might not even get it in the bird. It might just be the mini gunner uh, from 160th PID in the objective with an IR infrared laser that he's using saying that's the objective like fuck and and if I wasn't hooked up on comms my team leader's trying to relay it to me while I'm unassing the bird while I'm running to the objective but then we get on the objective we set containment rapidly we might hit it uh, because we landed on the x or the y we might do whatever we do but every time we do that we come out on top now there are instances which is based on chaos theory of shit going wrong, Mm -hmm. but that shit just happens. But for the most part, we're highly successful. And I thought, how the fuck can we do this intentionally putting ourselves in the worst case scenario? Intentionally. Yeah. Like we are literally intentionally um, putting ourselves in the worst case disaster and coming out on top every single time. And that's not luck. For us, the processes and the understanding of that, it's easy because we lived it. It's preparation. It's planning. It's planning. It's rehearsals, it's PCIs and paying attention to the equipment. It's in the R and D cycle of retaining the best equipment and cycling through out the shit shit equipment. It's looking at ourselves objectively, doing ARs that hurt people's feelings, making ourselves better in the training loop. It's all these processes that we get used to adapting in, where when we land, we just enact the SOP because we've focused on the process, and that li- lends itself to preparedness. So I was like fuck, that's my sergeant major mind. That's my operations mind. How can we contextualize that for a consumer? Ideally, a civilian. Ideally, a liberal civilian who doesn't even want to fuck with it. Because I wasn't one of those guys, 
I mean, I, I was born in Cali. Um, Where in Cali? Uh, Monterey. Santa Cruz. Oh, awesome. That's right on the road. Yeah. Um, I, I like the better part of the state. It's no big deal. Yeah, it, it's, it is better, actually. Monterey's <laughs> a fucking shit. 30, 30 miles apart. That's yeah. crazy that you were born in Monterey. Yeah. Yeah, I graduated Santa Cruz High. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Santa Cruz is awesome. I know the district attorney out in yeah. Santa Cruz. It's it's pretty it's okay. cool. It's changed a lot. I mean, they though. filmed a vampire movie at the boardwalk. It's no big deal. Which one is that? That's the uh, the old school, the Lost Boys. Yes, there you go. Yes, I remember the bridge that. they jumped off of. Is, I used to walk across that to go to the uh, boardwalk all the time. That's when it was fucking awesome. It's yeah. changed a lot. As has California. California, man, it's yeah. a shame because that place was fucking epic. It still is in little instances, but I, you know, really not isolating or narrowing my market saying preparedness or disasters rather or a equal opportunist a disaster doesn't give who, give a fuck who the who you are what color you are how high speed you are it will take you the fuck out look at what we're dealing with right now absolutely and there and there's what's interesting is my analytical mind looks at this like i did in operations where when you look at a disaster man-made or natural that's how we break them down it's a ball of energy and there's a whole, it's like a, it's like a hurricane where you use a Doppler radar to identify specific measures or metrics that you could extract and then better understand to make predictions in the model. Well, that's what a disaster is because disasters are just scenarios that include man-made behavior or natural phenomenon. And I realized that maybe there was an idea to teach processes, offer equipment that are adaptable in that environment and then teach people to be better prepared through learning the process. And in over, overarching, it sounds fucking complicated as fuck, but it's not. I mean, if I just focus on basic skill sets, and that's what we do, and we train those, we are creating a more adaptive environment for a civilian or military law enforcement to succeed in. You're talking again, proactive versus reactive. Yes, yeah, it absolutely is. I like that. Look, when when we started the company, if I couldn't convince a liberal to come out of his hidey hole in San Francisco and potentially look at us as an option, then I knew the model wouldn't work because there was not enough people on the right or conservative or that are preppers that are going to fucking help me in my market, especially pioneering survival. I mean, most people, when they think about survival, it's that naked and afraid shit, right? It's... The, the rubbing sticks together in, in the woods. If you've gotten to that point in your, in your planning process and contingency planning, you fucked up. Right? I, do you know who Brian Callen is? I do. Yeah. So, the, oh, the episode today I released with him. But when yeah, I, yeah, I, I saw that. Fuck, yeah. he's hilarious. He knows nothing about guns and <laughs> tactics. But he'd be like, listen, this is how I would do it. It's like, I want to shotgun with like 13 rounds and a short barrel. I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> The first time I ever met him, I was on their show, The Fighter and the Kid, and he was just like, what do you, like, you guys are out in a survival situation. He's like, how do you start a fire? I was like, Brian, I, I reach into my pocket, and I get a lighter. A big lighter. He's like, no, dude, <laughs> how do you do with the sticks? I was like, well, I would pile the sticks up, and I would get a lighter. He's like, well, what if that lighter doesn't work? I'm like, I have three more. They're small. <laughs> He's like, come on, man. Like, aren't you guys doing survival stuff? I'm like, I have not ever gotten to a point yes. where I would need that. Yeah. I, I have to imagine <laughs> I have to imagine the circumstance in which you find yourself in that situation, which is primitive survival, right? And, and we, you're gonna have huge problems on your hands. Huge. And I mean, one, to master, for example, that most training courses who are experts in bushcraft, because we work with them, takes at least two days just to learn how to do that. And that's if your equipment's prepped properly. Um, primitive survival is some of the hardest skill sets to attain. Years and years. Yeah. Not saying it's not important, but so much more focused on modern society and modern practices. And so if, if you know, we talk about contingencies all the time, if you're developing a primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency, and you're going down the fire protocol of uh, uh, instilling the pace plan, it's four fucking lighters. Or it's... It's a propane lighter versus a Bic lighter, a butane lighter. Uh, hurricane matches versus normal matches. But nowhere in that plan is my abilities to carry the equipment required to make a friction fire with sticks 
or a bow drill fire with sticks. Whatever, bro. I have a satchel full of sticks that I carry. <laughs> Some people do. <laughs> and I think it's it's not bad, but it's like... More power to them, but yeah. god damn, there's lighters out there that works. Yes. Why carry... Now, is it an important skill set overall in your survival game, especially if you live in rural Montana? Probably more important and more significant than somebody living in the city. Yeah, but also, I can walk really far in a day. Yeah. And I'll walk all night long on the coldest of days and stay, you know what I mean? Like there's yeah. other options that I think are more valuable. There is. So what, uh, I mean, so, you know, you teach and talk about survival. What do you, what are your thoughts on people's behavior dealing with what's currently going on? It's interesting, but it's, it's not surprising to me. I mean, I'm actually underwhelmed when people like the toilet paper thing. It's a good talking point. It's interesting to talk about because there's people going out and they're hoarding. But I, and I equate that to again as you know what percentage of information is positive versus negative. Yeah, they're like it's you know they're being but because of the fact they would probably fall into the category of not thinking for themselves. I don't yes. want to you know another yeah. not nice way to say that would be they're on the sheep side of the house. So they're basically being manipulated into that behavior without an understanding. There's no fucking shortage of toilet paper. Yeah, it's a herd mentality yeah. for sure. And, and when I see things like that, I I always try to look at these things. It, maybe it's the zen in me. I didn't used to have that in me. Um, war and a, a lot of experiences will fucking do that to you. But I try to have empathy in these people's circumstances. So, when I, so for example, I took this, and I talked about this before. I took a picture, uh, a screen capture of a picture of Costco, a line full of people with toilet paper in their fucking things. And if you look at the picture, most of the people are elderly, right? So they're over the age of 60. So one, they're in the window of being uh, the most likely to potentially die if yeah, they get high infected. Risk. They're high risk. So they're in a high risk category. They potentially don't have spouses because a lot of them were by themselves, 70s and 80s. So they're by themselves. Now, what's there? They're not watching potentially the media. This is the earlier stages of it. They're not watching CNN and watching everybody buy toilet paper in Michigan. Then they go out into fucking Phoenix, Arizona and buy toilet paper. They go to the store because somebody might have said, hey, we need to start fucking supplying. Or they're like, I need to get ahead of the curb. They put a thing of toilet paper in their shit. And what I tell people is, November of 2019, if you would have saw me at Costco buying a shit of a uh, you know, ton of toilet paper or paper towels, you would look at me and not even think about anything. Because, you know, Costco, just like Sam's Club, is used by a lot of business, uh, small businesses to get stuff at wholesale, or near wholesale prices, and then flip them or use them for their yeah. their uh, materials at their store. Yeah, you'd business. have been white noise in November. Nobody would have looked twice. Yeah, yeah. Nobody yeah. gave a fuck. But all of a sudden now, because 10 people are standing in line with it, who the fuck am I to judge? Like, one, I hope the fucking, the Sh Charmin and all these companies are crushing it. Two, I know the supply chain, especially in toilet paper and that kind of soft uh, consumer good, is, which is a consumable, is going to be replenished. Mm -hmm. So I'm not fucking worried about it. And partly why I, why I have that mindset is because I'm fucking prepared. I got everything I fucking need. I got enough baby wipes to wipe my ass for five years. Now, <laughs> did I do that reactively? This is, it's almost in your discussion, like this reactive nature versus the proactive, proactive nature. I, and there's I, a difference between paranoid and prepared. Yeah, absolutely. And I was, pre I was prepared. We, we, all the guys that I work with, Folk Survival, including myself, what's important about our reputation and I think status in a very small demographic of companies that focus on preparedness is that we fucking live it. Like, I'm not going to hire a guy who says, you know, I'd like to be more involved. If you don't live it because you don't think it's important enough to be a part of your life, then I don't want you to be the SME, the expert that's telling everybody how you should be. Yeah. So we were, we were prepared. And I look at behavior as a normalcy in chaotic and unknown circumstances. I, I can't imagine what it must be like being 75 years old, living on my own, not having shit, and then the only tube I turn into is fucking CNN because that's all I have at my fucking nursing home or my assisted living situation to watch. And then I'm like, fuck, I need to get fucking toilet paper. Well, I'm not going to be like, fuck you, man, for buying all the toilet paper. Like, oh, man, you want to wipe your ass with toilet paper? I'll use fucking a rock and water. I've seen it before. I can fucking knock it out. Like, you do you, I'll do me, Yeah, you know? More empathy. Tough to have. 
It is in these times. Yeah. I mean, I, I, people are inherently dumb. That's why bad things happen to fucking good people, especially in man-made catastrophes. But this is something we've never seen before. I like what you said about hiring the people that live it. Because otherwise, you still end up with an SME if you hire the other person, but it's a subject matter enthusiast, not a subject Ooh, yeah. matter expert. I'm going to steal that. I like that. I just made that up. Did you just make that up? I did. It might have been that kill cliff. That's, it is that kill it's cliff. It's that CVD. Listen, I'm an idiot, but sometimes I'm like... You're talking about enthusiasts. Oh my God, it's the same acronym. <laughs> <laughs> what E? Can, how can I change Hold up on. the E? E, subject matter excellence, subject matter <laughs> interpreter. Easter. I, shit, it yeah. was just Easter, yeah. so E. But that's what it ends up being. If they don't live it, they're an enthusiast. And I have no problem with enthusiasts, but you have to realize the difference between yeah. enthusiasm and experience. Another E, it's no big deal. It's fine. Well, it, that, I w- I'm curious to your opinion on that. Being somebody who has seen at the highest levels, what a real tactician that's executing his craft looks like. When you see all these young men, I haven't seen any women do it, but young men who have no experiences, they're truly not the subject matter expert. They're the most aggressive enthusiasts on the planet. Come out of the woodwork and they they do this perpetuation of these tactics that I think they're making up in in a lot of ways based on their imagination. What's your opinion of those guys? I think they're dangerous. Mm, I like that. You know, enthusiasm is great. And I I hope that everybody finds something that they're passionate and enthusiastic about. Maybe multiple things. You know, I hope that whatever it is that you're doing gives you some sense of uh, fulfillment as in person. You're enthusiastic about it and you're passionate about it. But if you're willingly putting yourself out there and promoting yourself, and you know at the end of the day, because if these people are for lack of a better term, putting out bullshit, they know they are. Like they're they live with that. They yeah. they live with it and they know it. And there is that essence of just the classic art of bullshitsu. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's a powerful art. <laughs> is that can, a thing? I don't know. That should be a book. <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. should be your first book. And it's uh fuck dude, I'm tapped out of a coloring book, trust me. <laughs> but they have to live with that. And I don't think favorably of them at all because you know, it's the same as the no punch knockout. There's, I was, I was talking, same thing. I was talking with the SWAT cop and I asked him, I'm like, who are you more worried about in that video? The person who is demonstrating the technique or the people that are following, are falling over. Who's the more dangerous person <laughs> in there? Think about it, right? They're both winning participants. Yeah. One's the bullshit artist, mm-hmm. but the other people are buying into it too. And both of those people are fucking dangerous. Just like the people who are putting out stuff, they're probably, what I would imagine most of those people are doing, is they're scraping from legitimate information and they're adding a twist to it, right? Yeah. So they can differentiate themselves in some way or they'll put a, you know, it's the equivalent of putting an Instagram filter on a picture, right? You're stealing somebody's picture, but you're putting a filter on it so it looks a little bit different. And if people don't know the difference, and unfortunately... You know, there's so much access to information and overwhelming access to information that doesn't mean you have an overwhelming access to the truth. And that's yeah. tough for people to differentiate unless they have touch points and experience. It's a, an environment much like martial arts or fuck weapons training. Come on, man. I've seen some pistol rifle advertisements where I'm just like, what are you talking about? Yeah. But there's people at the classes because yeah. they don't have they don't have the ability to discern the truth from the bullshit because bullshit is an ancient art. I'm telling you, man, <laughs> I want that tag, man. Bullshit. <laughs> we should just have a shirt that has a picture of a shih tzu has no, un- no correlation to bu- bullshit. Yeah. But it just says bullshit. We could split the profits on that. Go I'm to charity. That'll be our first collaboration. Let's That's just it. Do it. Done. Bullshit I got a teacher guy in town. I'll run it by him today. <laughs> yeah. Bullshit. No, you're, you're right, man. I, I, uh, my mom, and she'll fucking kill me for telling the story, but <laughs> my mom. That's was, how you know it's going to be good. <laughs> it's going to be good. My mom was trying to find God, you know, and she was, you know, she she met my father when she was in Korea, living in Korea. My dad was stationed there. And the typical GI story, right? GI meets young Asian or fill in the fucking blank, um, brings him back, shits on him. They fucking, they're flailing and flapping and trying to do their own thing, trying to make uh, the best they can with what they got, which is little. 
my mom in this particular story gets left behind in Germany, makes her way back to the United States, tries to get custody and is in this battle because she can't speak English. She is a naturalized citizen because of the, the, the marriage and that might be fucking wrong. I'm, I'm an idiot. I think it's correct. That, I think that's it, right? You speak Korean? Yes. Okay. So brings her back, or, or a, a German guy brings her back, and they, they settle in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And until I was 12, I lived with my dad. I mean, me and my father, after I was born and raised, and we danced around a little bit and fucking lived in different shitholes. But at the age of 12, I decided to live with my mom from the ages of 13 until 16 when I left. So for that few years, my mom was going through some shit. You know, she had been shit on by my dad. My dad was her first love, all kinds of drama. So in rural North Carolina, Baptist is one of the biggest uh, religions. Yeah, Presbyterian, Baptist, all kinds of different variants, and Catholic versions of the Christian religion. And I didn't understand what the fuck was going on. I'm like, all right, wait, you're, so we're going to a Catholic church today. And next week we're going to uh, a tent because they're doing a revival. I'm like, hmm. is this the same shit? And so we, she was, what she was doing was she was trying to get different messages and determine what she wanted to be. And I'm assuming at the time she was also lost. I mean, she was fucking lost. So we go to a fucking revival tent. This is after experimenting with religion and, and me being part of this going, this is fucking crazy or this is pretty cool. You know, the Baptist thing, I, I was like, this is cool until they dunked me. And I was like, that's eh, kind of weird. But, <laughs> but, and they forced me down in the water. But I, I was digging it because it had community. It was teaching morals. Mm. The kids were cool. I, it, it was good. It was good for my mom. Then we went to this revival tent. And I have an aunt, my mom's sister from Korea. She's married to a service member too. But they were there together and we were there, me and my cousin. And I remember they were getting all hyped and fucking excited. And the guy started talking in tongues. And I didn't, I couldn't discern what the fuck he was saying. I was like, what? The? I was like, mom, what is he saying? I was like, I don't know. She was like in shock too. She's like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. And my mom didn't know this, but my aunt is super into this shit. My aunt stands up and starts talking in fucking tongues. Her eyes rolled back in her head. And me and my cousin look at her like, what the fuck is going on? And my, my mom is like, look at her like, oh shit. Like, this is real. And so I'm assuming at some point sh you have to get committed. But we weren't on that track, right? We're just like experimenting at the time. So the guy asks people to come forward. And he starts touching people on the head and they're fucking falling to the ground. And I'm like, whoa, this is insane. And dude, I'm a fucking kid. I'm 13 years old, 14 yeah. years old. Fuck, that's a lot to take in at that age. I, dude, I'm like, this is fucking bananas. So they asked me and my cousin to come up. And I'm like, no fucking way. And I'm like, <laughs> my mom's like, go, go. Because she doesn't want to be the fucking victim, right? She's like, you go up there. I'm like, fuck. And I get up there. And I remember looking at my cousin. And we're like, oh, shit, this is deep shit. And this guy's like talking in tongues. And he's yelling. And everybody's in tongues. And this isn't one of those sweat tents. But I feel like everybody's fucking sweating. It just, it, the memory comes back. Everybody's dirty and sweating and shit. And he touches and says something to my cousin, touches his head, and he fucking falls down. <laughs> and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, oh, my fuck. Did he, like, is, is he, like, hurt or, like, what's going on? And then he, he rolls on the side, and he kind of looks at me, and he kind of smiles. And I'm like, this motherfucker. So he goes to touch me, and I'm not going down because I'm like, I, I don't know what's happening, and I'm waiting for something, and I'm thinking this dude's going to shock me, or yeah. and nothing happens, and I'm like, what the fuck? So I just sit down, and he kind of forces me down with his hand, and he pushes me to the ground, and I just lay down, and I roll over, and I'm like looking at my cousin face to face, and I'm like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> dude, and I go back, and my mom is, is uh, you know, she's in shock, and she looks at me, and she goes, let's get the fuck out of here. Like, what the fuck is going on? And we didn't have any more of those ex experiences because she knew that everything she was experiencing in that sense, for some people, was God. It was like a voice of God in tongues. But for us, we weren't believers. And we knew the deal. And yeah. we were like, these motherfuckers are full of shit. And so uh, I'm telling you that story because 
I want people to relate to it in the sense that you could buy into anything if you're invested enough. And the dangerous thing about tactics is to live tactics means to put your life on the line. So you could be a SWAT cop. You could be a military member in certain capacities in combat arms. You could be a member of the most elite counterterrorism units in the world. But you've accepted that risk. You've accepted, I am going to commit my life to enacting my tactics for survival, but also accept that I might potentially get killed. And these kids who LARP, because it's tactical LARPing, that should be another shirt. Live action role playing. <laughs> All I'm saying is give it a Google. <laughs> Look for the one larfers. that goes lightning bolt, lightning bolt, <laughs> lightning bolt. <laughs> Fuck, man. And, and, and these kids, I think when they're talking about these tactics that they inherently have no business about talking or talking about because they haven't experienced it, right? They don't know what right looks like even. Um, we should take that as a consumer, as somebody who's willing to learn to enact that own tactic, right? You teach somebody to do some shit like retract shot from their hip. You better know the fucking reason you're doing that. You don't just get grabbed up in a bar and get headbutted. Then you fucking retract shoot a fucking dude yeah. in the stomach and the chest because you saw it on a YouTube video. Um, that's the danger in it. Yeah, there is a lot of danger in those snake oil salesmen. And, uh, you know, I spend most of the time watching those uh, fake martial arts videos. I don't even watch the, the person doing the demo. I just watch the people in the crowd. Oh, yeah. And you're like, fuck, I could sell you a goddamn island in Idaho right now. Dude, they're so bought in. People want to believe. That shit. I know. They want to believe, man. Yeah. What? Uh, speaking of survival-wise, um, I think about this because I spend so much time driving and most people spend so much time in their car. Survival perspective, go bag in a car. What would you recommend? Minimum items. So... We actually have mobility packs that we package a certain way that are built for vehicle rigs. It's a panel pack, right? You know, the standard panel pack. Oh, I saw one of those in your story. You were yeah. Talking. yeah. We, we, cause, because we, we want people to have, I think what's important about survival is it has to be convenient. It's like if you carry a gun in the wrong position on your pants and then you go to sit in your car and you're like, fuck, this is annoying. You'll never wear it again. So you'll never have protection. Um, so the start point is the bag, and I, I obviously can condone my bag. Um, the, the panel pack it makes it so you have easy access to the equipment, but you also want to be able to roll it up. It turns into a backpack and then bug out with it, so it serves multiple purposes. In that bag, a minimum of a survival kit. Survival are the staples. I'm talking about how to make a, a fire, how to potentially utilize shelter to keep your core body temperature, I mean, most people die in um, survival incidents because of hypothermia, because their core body temperature crashes, and uh, they're not able to retain that. So a Mylar space blanket is recommended. Multiple versions of that, meaning multiple sizes, yep. even the bivy sack version of that, because you could retain your core body temperature. You have a catastrophic bleed because you cut yourself being a dumbass. Well, guess what? That Mylar space blanket is going to be essential after you start bleeding because you're gonna, your core body temperature is going to go, yep. crash. Uh, signal is always important um, in multiple various forms. Uh, everything from a whistle because it's an audible signal that transponds further or travels further than your voice. And is not natural. And it's unnatural. actually yep. stands out for, for a reason. Um, in addition to that, we tell people to carry trauma kits. Uh, trauma is likely to be seen on the roads. When 30,000 people a year die from vehicle accidents, but there's over 9 million accidents. Yeah. And I always think about the variable between probably death number one and then 9 million, how many of those people were catastrophically injured and then died? And then how many of those people could have been saved because they had some type of traumatic injury kit? I've personally come upon three accidents, either watch them happen or shortly thereafter. This place is... Brutal for it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it really is. The White Cross is here because the I think Department of Transportation works through one of the veteran organizations. It might be Veteran of Foreign Wars or something like that to post those crosses wherever there's a fatality. As a reminder, accident, yeah. As a reminder. For a long time, there wasn't a speed limit in Montana, so we have to factor that as well. Dude. It was the reasonable speed that you thought was reasonable. Really? Time. <laughs> <laughs> when you have a couple beers in you. I think yeah. reasonable is 120. <laughs> I don't know what you think it is, but yeah. Yeah, it's dangerous here, man. You could, yeah. um, I, 
It's know. remote by yeah. geography, topography, and actual just population size. Yeah. And hitting an elk out here, that would be a very bad day. And, I, you, know, you know, deer are constantly coming across yeah. the roads. And, you know, people worry about, oh, I don't want to hurt the deer. Well, those suckers come through windshields, too. Yeah. And if it's a, you know... If it's a male with a rack in that season coming through your windshield, stand by. Yes. They actually say, some people will tell you that acceleration is the tactic when seeing a deer that you know you're going to strike because you never want to deviate. You never want to try to go around a deer that you're going to strike. Now, there's deer where you could obviously slow down if you're going 35, but if you're on the highway going highway speeds, which here in Montana, it's 70 to 80 miles an hour. You, you don't want to avoid or do any evasive, aggressive, evasive, uh, evasive maneuver. You want to fucking plow through them because the likelihood of you surviving because you plow through them versus getting and locking the anti-lock brakes on the front end of your vehicle and then nose diving the front end and then that scooping that deer up oh, through yeah. your windshield. Oh, man, that would, that would be a ramp right up into your face. Fucking ramp, man, and it happens all the time, but that – they tell people to stay off your brakes because you'll, you know, you, the transfer of energy. And yeah, actually, if you gas it, it would raise the front end a little raise bit. Raise the front end, yeah. Yeah. And keeping a loop on your on your rig. But trauma, uh, minimum for trauma is, is a cat tourniquet, a cat seven tourniquet. It's funny how we started out in the military with cravats and sticks. Yeah. And now we're at the point where, you know, most of the GWAT, we use cat tourniquets. And they save lives, man. It's 29 fucking dollars. Yeah. It's like all the people who talk about being tactical gods and these experts in preparedness, but they don't have a tourniquet on them or in in their vehicle. Um, and also, it should be step number one. You know, number one. People used to be so... I remember when we they first started issuing, they're like, I put a tourniquet on a dude. Um, a neighbor of mine basically had an interesting uh, experience with a bandsaw. And I was like Oof. raking in the front yard. I heard a saw click on and then... Ah! I was like, that didn't happen. There's no way. That's some movie shit. <laughs> but I ended up, you know, putting a tourniquet on the dude. And when the first responders showed up, they were like, oh, well, well when would you put that on? You know, because they were, they hadn't even been exposed to it yet, right? Because of the trickle down. Yeah. And it was like, oh, no more than 30 minutes. It's like, dude, I know people who have had those things on 24 hours. Yes. You know, slap that sucker on. That's the biggest, like when we educate people, that's the first thing that we mention is there's a lot of urban myths that exist around that. In fact, when I went to EMT school a long time ago, it, through the military, tourniquets weren't used because that of that exact reason. Yeah. They say, hey, if you put one on, you're going to lose the extremity. And because of the awesome uh, you know, data that's accumulated from casualties in the GWAT, uh, even given unfortunate circumstances, they've declared it's not an issue. Yeah, and, and and I always tell people, look, the fucking alternative is you just die. Yeah, like put a tourniquet on, risk the loss of the extremity, which isn't going to be likely, or fucking die. Simply go to sleep and never fucking wake up. And that's that's why I think, you know, we do statistical probabilities in survival and preparedness. We are not just exclusively teaching how to shoot fucking guns and defend your life because the probability of you doing that is so very low. Yeah, um, in your home, outside of your home, it's so very low, but so very high that you're going to come across or be exposed either personally or with your friends or family to medical trauma. And you can either be an asset or a liability in that situation. Yeah. And, and what I tell people is, look, man, the training for that shit's not hard. All the people that I've talked to who said, why the fuck would you teach that to civilians? are people who are trying to protect what's theirs, right? Yep. There are these, there's the, there's, they think they own the monopoly on medical fucking training. Get the fuck out of here. Like, I could build a fucking Tesla hybrid in my garage off of YouTube, but you think it's a problem if I learn through YouTube or some training course that's not NAMT certified how to apply a fucking tourniquet or stop the bleed? You have to be able to do that, and it's very easy. It's The principles, quite, quite simply, are just that. They're simple. Very simple. Yeah. And, and I think what you, what you said, principles and everything are so important because... Take the equipment outside of it. If you understand the principles of things, then you could adapt because you're cognitive and you're thinking about ways to adapt versus just focused on one way, one use, uh, one piece of equipment, and then that fails and you have no alternatives. Yep. Focus on the principles. We're over three hours. Shut the fuck up, really? 313. Yeah. Shut the fuck up. It was an awesome conversation. How can people find you in... Three hours? Yeah. So this, obviously, we'll have to do an episode. We'll do another one again, for sure. Yeah, that was awesome. Where Damn. Can, yeah, where can people find you and support you? 
Man, um, philcraftsurvival.com, that's everything that we do. Um, my personal Instagram, which I post a lot of content just on on the stuff that we talked about, is mike.a.glover. Uh, we do have a podcast. We have a website. Um, the biggest thing that I encourage people to do is go to our YouTube because uh, the Phil Kraft Survival channel, we post a video every week in preparedness, everything from mindset to technical to tactical, uh, and it's fucking free. So, yeah, man, yeah. I appreciate you guys just checking out our channels if you're interested. Hell yeah. Dude, thanks for taking the time, man, and making the drive. No, it's fucking awesome. I'm man. glad we crossed paths finally. Yeah, this for is sure. awesome. It's been an awesome time, and I appreciate what you do, and uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, dude, round two shortly.